Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the February Mid-Atlantic Council meeting. Sorry for the late start as we had to get a few pictures taken this morning. Uh, before we officially start the, with the agenda items, I'd like to recognize Dr. Cisco Warner. Uh, he's from the Division of Scientific Program and Chief Science Advisor. Cisco, would you like to say a few words? Good morning, everybody, um, and good to see everybody again. It's been a while that uh, I've had a chance to be uh, with you in person, and thank you for the opportunity to just say a few words. Um, I, um, I am not, I'm, as you said, I'm Cisco Werner. I'm the Chief Science Advisor for NOAA Fisheries. Um, I, uh, I'm based here in Silver Spring, and so I'm taking the opportunity of, of spending uh, this morning with you and catching up on issues that, uh, that, that, um, that, that you're, you're going to be discussing, as well as um, being here and available for any perhaps offline conversations or such uh, that, that may come up. And um, if I could, you know, maybe uh, sometime in the future, I would uh, welcome the opportunity, if, as appropriate, uh, you know, perhaps to come and, and speak to you more formally about some of the uh, things that we're doing, some of the opportunities perhaps that uh, Janet uh, uh, quite spoke about yesterday that, that we're looking forward to. And so again, thank you for the opportunity to say good morning. And and um, and again, I'm here and available, um, you know, to and looking forward to any opportunity for conversation this morning. So thank you, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Let's start with the first agenda item this morning. Uh, it's going to be on highly migratory species and update. And Randy Blankenship is here to give a presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Randy Blankenship. I'm the chief of the Atlantic Highland Migratory Species Management Division. I'm um, thankful for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'll be pro uh, providing a, a presentation at a high level overview of some of our um, management initiatives that we have going on, some of our more significant um, management initiatives, uh, and then uh, also providing an overview of the outcomes of the uh, 2022 ICAT annual meeting. You all are probably aware that Atlantic HMS are not managed through the council process. Um, they are managed by NOAA Fisheries directly. Um, however, um, within Atlantic HMS Management Division, uh, we do coordinate with the councils um, from New England through the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean um, on our management measures. Um, and uh, the invitation that you all extended to me to present today certainly is an opportunity for us to do that, and I really appreciate that opportunity. The HMS Management Division is within the Office of Sustainable Fisheries uh, at headquarters in Silver Spring. Um, you may be aware that our HMS Management Division has offices located not only in Silver Spring, but also in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, those uh, regional areas are co-located with the regional offices in those locations. And uh, my office uh, is actually um, located in, in St. Petersburg, Florida. So that is where I call home, just for your information. So let me, I'll have to coordinate here between a couple of different, there we go. Um, just to give you a heads up about where I'll go with the presentation, uh, I'll touch base on some recently finalized domestic management initiatives, uh, and then also touch on uh, some current and upcoming domestic uh, management initiatives, and then uh, provide the overview of the outcomes of the ICAP meeting um, in November of 2022. So first of all, uh, I wanted to touch on uh, a final rule, a final amendment 13 that deals with the management of bluefin tuna. Uh, this final rule published uh, back in October of last year, and we have been implementing this uh, beginning uh, January 1st of this year. Um, this amendment refined the individual bluefin quota or IBQ program uh, and changed the, this is a catch share program for bluefin tuna, which are incidentally caught uh, in longline, pelagic longline fisheries um, that are targeting uh, yellowfin tuna uh, and swordfish primarily. Um, so it changed the, um, the IBQ program for allocations to be made dynamically uh, based upon fishing effort. Um, and that is determined by number of sets that the vessel makes over a three year period on an ongoing basis. Uh, this amendment also um, sunsetted 
the per seine category um, and then transferred uh, or reallocated the per seine category bluefin quota to the other uh, bluefin categories um, domestically. There are several other measures that took, that uh, were done in this um, amendment, um, including uh, one of the other ones was the creation of a new, for the angling category, a new bluefin quota management area um, for trophy bluefin uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So moving along uh, to another uh, management measure that we implemented, this one a little bit further back, it was in July of last year. Um, Oops, go you know, uh, to short fin, uh, dealing with short fin Mako. This was the implementation of recommendation 2109 from ICAT, uh, which uh, when we implement uh, creates a um, retention limit of zero or no retention in the commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, this is because of the poor stock status of short fin Mako. Um, but also a management measure adopted at ICAT uh, that seeks to uh, facilitate rebuilding of this stock internationally. So this went into effect um, back in the summer and has been in place uh, since then. Uh, this recommendation does provide for an opportunity for some potential for harvest in the future uh, if uh, mortality levels across the Atlantic are reduced to a certain level. Um, right now that is um, 250 metric tons across the Atlantic. Um, but um, that provision would only be uh, taken if ICAT decides to implement it um, at a future time. Some ongoing um, management initiatives that we have uh, include uh, seeking to, in a programmatic and systematic way, uh, conduct research and data collection in support of spatial fishery management. Um, we are planning to call this uh, Amendment 15, and it is in uh, development right now, although we have been working on this for quite some time. You may notice here that we have been, we uh, conducted scoping uh, on this uh, issue back in 2019. Um, the issue at hand is that we have several um, time area closures for pelagic longline fishing um, and potentially in the future, uh, maybe other time area closures for other fisheries as well. Um, and Specifically for our time area closures for pelagic longline fishing, some of those have been in place for 20 years. And because of those closures uh, and the lack of fishing that um, has occurred within those areas, there is um, minimal amount of information uh, about um, the fishing uh, within those areas and actually whether or not those areas are still accomplishing the objectives under which they were originally created. And so um, this initiative seeks to, as I said, in a systematic way, develop a process uh, by which um, some fishing could occur in some of those areas um, and data could be collected to analyze whether or not they are still the most appropriate in time and space and if they're accomplishing their objectives. This initiative um, incorporates a new um, model uh, that uh, that we have developed called PRISM, and you see it there towards the end of, of, the, of the slide. Uh, PRISM stands for Predictive Spatial Modeling, and this is a model that uh, we published a, a paper on. Um, if you go to the link here, you can find a link to the scientific paper that describes the, um, uh, the, the protocol and the process for PRISM. Um, and this incorporates observer data uh, and environmental conditions in order to um, uh, make a, a prediction about um, the risk of certain areas and whether um, in some areas uh, interactions with bycatch species uh, may occur or may be more likely in other areas where it may be less likely, which will help to guide uh, the process potentially to allow for some fishing within some areas um, under exempted fishing permits or scientific research permits. We um, are still working and developing this um, proposed rule and anticipate uh, being able to put it out and publish it in the Federal Register this spring. We also recently finalized Amendment 14 uh, dealing with shark management. Um, this did not have a uh, rule associated with it, uh, but the amendment was released uh, in January 
It establishes a new framework for implementing uh, acceptable biological catch or ABCs and annual catch limits. Um, it creates the process to account for carryover or under harvest of quota, along with the option to phase in ABC control rules and adopt multiple multi year overfishing status determination criteria. We intend to follow on with Amendment 14 uh, with uh, draft Amendment 16, which we are developing now, uh, that would incorporate the framework of Amendment 14 and also the findings of our fishery analysis that we conducted over the last couple of years and released last year, and that is called the Atlantic Shark Fishery Review, or the acronym SHARE. So Amendment 16 um, would have the goal of trying to increase management flexibility uh, to various factors that are affecting the shark fishery um, and account for changes in distribution of shark harvest among se sectors. We anticipate that we will be conducting scoping uh, beginning this spring, so be on the lookout for that. We also have uh, underway the five-year review of HMS essential fish habitat. We do this uh, periodically, um, actually required to uh, take a look at updating every five years of this. We announced in April of 2022 that we were embarking on this process to evaluate uh, whether it, updates of EFH were um, uh, appropriate uh, and requested information back uh, in the spring and <laughs> in the spring and early summer to facilitate this evaluation. And we anticipate releasing the draft five five year review uh, this spring as well. So now I'll move into an overview of the ICAT. Um, annual meeting uh, from last year. Um, ICAT is the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, and they <clears throat> are formed and, um, and exist to manage uh, tuna and tuna-like species that include uh, tunas, billfish, swordfish, and sharks uh, throughout the Atlantic, um, and also some bycatch species um, uh, that include seabirds and, and uh, sea turtles. Recommendations that are agreed to at ICAT are binding on the member nations uh, and decisions are typically made by consensus. There are uh, currently 52 contracting parties at ICAT. So that's uh, 52 basically member nations, uh, one of which includes the EU. Uh, so there's groups of nations like that. Um, the HMS Management Division, which I head, implements domestically the ICAT recommendations, and we do so under the authority of the Atlantic Tunas Convention Act. So the annual meeting in 2022 occurred in November, and it was held in uh, Portugal. Uh, this was the first in-person meeting since 2019. Um, it was a hybrid meeting. Uh, and uh, was uh, was very good to be together again um, for this meeting. Negotiations are much easier in person than they are um, in the virtual world. The um, recommendations uh, and resolutions that were adopted uh, at this annual meeting uh, will be implemented, but implementation domestically for us do not require any changes to U.S. regulations. Some of the key outcomes, and I'll be uh, giving you an overview of these, uh, was uh, in this one, a much anticipated uh, development and adoption of a management procedure for bluefin tuna for both the eastern and western stocks. Uh, this was a long process, um, uh, beginning with management strategy evaluation and negotiations on uh, management objectives, uh, and then the, the final adoption of the management procedure. Uh, this applies pre-agreed framework uh, for actions um, and setting catch limits that are designed to achieve specific management object objectives regarding stock status, safety, stability, and yield. The management proce procedure establishes a, a TAC or total allowable catch for 2023 through 2025 for each stock. And it maintains um, for the Western area, the 2022 TAC of 2,726 metric tons. So basically it implemented the, the, the TAC under the management procedure, but it stays the same as it was previously um, at that same TAC level. 
So then there are actually two recommendations that apply for us in the West, and this is representing the second one, a rec recommendation 2210 for Western Atlantic bluefin tuna. Um, once again, this includes the TAC that was established uh, for bluefin tuna in the management procedure, um, and then um, implements the U.S. quota, or actually establishes the U.S. quota of 1,341 metric tons, which is once again the same as it was uh, previously. Um, we had in 2022 uh, enjoyed a 5% increase in this uh, quota uh, for the United States, which had already been implemented, and it will continue uh, that same um, quota level for us domestically. So this recommendation updated research provisions in line with activities identified by the SCRS, which is ICAT scientific body, um, including um, supporting work needed to facilitate future reconditioning of the management strategy evaluation uh, and operating models and review of the management procedure in six years, that's 2028. So moving along to other outcomes, uh, this next one related to sharks and shortfin mako, which was uh, in this specifically is South Atlantic shortfin mako, um, the manager um, of North Atlantic shortfin mako had occurred over uh, the previous year and years leading up to that. So this one concentrated on South Atlantic shortfin mako, um, established a total um, retention allowance uh, with individual CPC or contracting party allowances. Um, and it established a total mortality level um, uh, uh, um, to be established following the 2024 stock assessment. There are many provisions in this measure that are similar to the North Atlantic short term MACO um, recommendation that was adopted in 2021, um, uh, but it does not um, prohibit retention. Um, so that is just a, one thing to, to uh, be aware of related to South Atlantic short term MACO. And then moving on, um, related to the ongoing issue every year for the United States at ICAT, which is the fins naturally attached issue, where the United States uh, has um, uh, supported uh, and worked with partner countries uh, to advocate for adoption of a requirement for fins to be naturally attached to the carcasses of sharks when they're landed so that it facilitates better identification of sharks and better um, uh, uh, management um, of those shark species. But it was ultimately blocked as it has been for several years uh, this last year by Japan and China. So we will continue to work on that in future years. Moving on uh, to tropical tunas, uh, specifically big eye and yellowfin tunas, uh, there was the adoption of recommendation 2201, which is a one year extension of this measure. Um, it maintains the already existing big eye tuna tack of 62,000 metric tons, uh, which is a good thing given the uncertainty of the stock assessment. And then it also maintains the elephant and tuna tack at 110,000 metric tons across the Atlantic. The tack and allocation and other management measures are anticipated to be revisited in 2023 and also in intersessional meetings that will occur, uh, one coming up um, uh, shortly actually. So for the United States, uh, there is not a quota allocation. Um, we are not under a limit uh, for these species. Um, we are relatively minor harvester uh, compared to many of the other nations Atlantic wide. So moving on to North Atlantic swordfish, uh, recommendation 2203 uh, was adopted, which is a one year rollover um, of the existing management measures uh, and it maintains the the current tack of 13,200 metric tons for the Atlantic and maintains the US quota uh, of 3,907 metric tons. Um, it also um, will give a nod to uh, next year, uh, actually this year as we are right now, um, with a stock assessment that will be conducted this year um, and the ongoing uh, management strategy evaluation uh, and development of a management procedure for North Atlantic swordfish uh, later this year um, that would determine tax uh, for 2024 and onward. So we're hoping to accomplish with North swordfish much along the lines of what was accomplished for bluefin tuna last year. 
So moving on to some other uh, key outcomes, um, these related to um, monitoring, control, and surveillance measures to uh, help address IUU fishing. There were several uh, proposals that were adopted, uh, including um, a requirement for ICAP parties to investigate and take action to address allegations of IUU fishing by their citizens. Um, and this measure will cover not only the, um, the vessel and, the, and the, um, the fishermen with that vessel, but also those benefiting uh, from or supporting the IUU activity, including financial support um, for that activity. Also, um, there was a management uh, measure adopted uh, to provide common standards or a schedule of compliance actions for evaluating the severity of non-compliance incidents and applying responsive actions in a fair and transparent manner. So this is much like the schedule of uh, violations that uh, has developed um, in, on, from the federal government side for to help enforcement uh, and also by some states uh, and a very similar type measure was adopted here at ICAT this last year. Um, also, um, measures were adopted to require electronic reporting for certain scientific and compliance related data that will help with the efficiency of reporting. So another important development um, this last year was a resolution uh, which was adopted uh, related to climate change. Uh, so this was a U.S.-led proposal that calls on the Commission to account for the impacts of climate change on ICAP-managed species and related ecosystems. And so this proposal instigates a process to evaluate available information and data gaps and research needs uh, that will help uh, the Commission to um, work on future management measures of ICAP species and incorporate climate into that process. In uh, later this year, uh, actually in July, ICAT will convene a joint meeting of science and managers chaired by the United States um, uh, to begin this uh, conversation. Also, an important uh, measure that was adopted uh, this last year was Recommendation 2212, dealing with uh, mitigating bycatch of uh, sea turtles uh, throughout the uh, throughout the Atlantic. And this was also a, a measure that was led by the United States, uh, something that, um, that the U.S. has been working on at ICAP for quite some time in order to better protect sea turtles uh, as they are um, bycatch in, um, in, in ICAP fisheries. Um, this requires uh, that a science-based mitigation measure be adopted by each country at ICAT uh, in their longline fisheries, in their shallow set longline fisheries, such as the use of circle hooks um, throughout the Atlantic Ocean. Um, that is one type of measure that can be taken. Um, other scientific-based measures could also be taken, um, but this is a, uh, represents really a sea change um, in ICAT and something, as I mentioned, the U U.S. has been working on for quite some time. Um, it not only uh, you know, will, will end up protecting sea turtles, uh, but also helps to um, level the playing field somewhat um, with other fisheries uh, internationally compared to the United States fisheries. So also uh, there was negotiations that took place and quite a bit of progress on developing a high seas boarding and inspection uh, scheme uh, within the ICAT convention area. Uh, this was not a measure that was adopted, but there was significant progress made that will continue uh, in future discussions at ICAT uh, to help address IUU fishing. So, as is always the case, uh, the United States will be fully engaged uh, throughout this year in intersessional meetings uh, and also at the, at the annual meeting uh, in November uh, to um, uh, to prioritize the implementation of measures in, uh, to conserve and manage ICAT species um, and promote um, conservation and management and rebuilding of some of those species that are overfished. There are several intersessional inter meetings that are occurring uh, this year. Uh, one is on uh, tropical tunas, that's panel one at ICAT, uh, where some of the priority issues will be related to uh, the TAC and allocation, uh, specifically for big eye tuna and other management measures. 
as well as working on um, management strategy evaluation for Western skipjack tuna. Also for bluefin tuna in panel two, uh, an intercessional will be working on exceptional circumstances protocol uh, for the management procedure, as well as Eastern bluefin allocations. And then on panel four, which um, uh, works with uh, swordfish, uh, billfishes, and bycatch species, uh, priority issue will be uh, furthering the North Atlantic swordfish management strategy evaluation and working towards adoption of a management procedure uh, at the annual meeting. And then also the climate change joint experts meeting, as I mentioned before, will be occurring in July. So if you have um, uh, any questions or want more information, uh, links are provided in the presentation. You can uh, take a look at our Atlantic HMS website for more information, as well as the ICAT website. You can feel free to contact me uh, related to domestic management or anything else in this presentation. And then also I've got a contact on this slide uh, for our Office of International Affairs, Trade and Commerce, uh, Maddie Harris. Uh, who is a very good resource uh, for questions related to ICAT. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for the presentation, Randy. Uh, I got a couple questions. On the swordfish quota, uh, does that include recreational and commercial? Yes, it does. Uh, we. Um, manage our sword, U.S. swordfish quota domestically um, for commercial and recreational fisheries. Is the quota getting anywhere close to being caught? No, the swordfish quota has been under harvested in the United States for several years. Um, and we have uh, been intentionally uh, over several years working to find ways to improve and create additional opportunities to harvest that quota. And that effort continues. Okay. Are you starting to notice though there is a, a slight increase on recreational landings now? Because it, it seems like the recreational guys have figured out how to catch them now. Uh, there has been an increase over the years um, in recreational landings. Um, there have been uh, some interesting trends that have occurred, new technology and techniques that have been employed, um, not only in the recreational fishery, but on the commercial side as well. One of those is the development of um, uh, deep um, deep setting uh, or deep fishing with rod and reel. Um, they call it deep dropping. Um, and that has been quite successful in many of the areas um, uh, in the Atlantic and, and Gulf of Mexico. Um, so that is uh, a technique that's used, as I said, recreational and commercially. All right, thank you. Dewey Hummerick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Randy, for your presentation. Can you go to your page, uh, the PRISM page? And my question is, and probably a comment I'm sure that I'll have, is that this PRISM model, as you said, is gonna be based on observer data to look at possibly going into closed areas. And to my knowledge, there's been no observer work done in these closed areas to date, uh, post circle hooks. And currently vessels have um, vessel monitoring systems we have at least two cameras on our vessels, and we also have observers placed on vessels. And I'm just curious as to why that is not good enough uh, and up to the standard that which a U.S. fisherman has to do to go into these areas uh, to look at fishing this way instead of taking extensive amount of time to produce a prison model that has not been tested uh, in these closed areas. And it seems to me that um, that this could already been done and tested and maybe you put a work group together of a certain amount of fishermen who wanted to participate in this closed areas that you're looking to already use in, while you were developing your PRISM model. And, and I'm just curious why that has not been done. These, these uh, certain areas uh, have been closed for over 20 years. And being the U.S. as a leader and a minor, minor player in the harvest, and given that the U.S. fleet seems to be the guinea pig for the rest of the world, uh, why haven't we achieved that yet instead of uh, trying to develop a model? And, and I, I, um, my frustration is that we continue to kick the can down the road 
And uh, I'm glad you didn't use the word uh, revitalization today because I'm tired of hearing that word and not seeing results. And I'm just wondering why we're, we're still waiting when we have the accountability on our vessels now and, and it doesn't seem to be want to be used. Thank you. Thanks, Dewey, I appreciate that. Um, and, you know, uh, this initiative, uh, which we will be calling Amendment 15, um, is, is the continuation of an intentional process to do that very thing, uh, which is find ways to be able to uh, systematically uh, collect information from, from within those areas. You mentioned PRISM, um, and uh, it is true that observer data, um, one of the weaknesses of, our, our, of the time area closures as they exist right now, is that we don't have um, very much information from within those areas, observer data or other data at all. Um, and, um, and so uh, PRISM uh, in concept uh, is a model that takes observer data that is available from outside of those areas um, and in, incorporates uh, environmental information about um, sea temperature, uh, sea surface height, chlorophyll, and some of those aspects uh, into that model uh, to make predictions about what will be occurring within the time area closures um, and then um, provide information about risk of encounters uh, with bycatch species. Um, so then by, we intend through this to be able to incorporate um, that concept um, into um, identifying some areas where data could be collected within those, um, within those time area closures um, that would have minimal risk of interaction with protected resources uh, or other issues uh, that, that might be of concern within those, um, within those time area closures. Um, so there will be more information that the specifics of how that will be done when we bring when we are able to put the proposed rule out. Um, uh, it is our intent to to be intentional about um, a, a, and systematic, as I said, about um, creating a way for data to be collected from within those areas. The sensitivity around those relates to the original objectives of the time area closures, uh, the protected species that can be uh, interacted with uh, by fishing gear in those areas. Um, and so those are things that we have to take seriously as we try to move forward. Go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, yeah. With respect to, to that um, sensitivity and conceptual, uh, there's also reality. Trying to make a model that predicts uh, where something's gonna happen at in the ocean and the variable to fishing is kind of sometimes impossible. Until you actually conceptually put hooks in the water in an area that the conservation methodology that the commercial fishermen US pelagic longline industry is currently done is how you're gonna get your conceptual model and a base. So a minimal standard of allowing sits or something in a particular area with all this observation uh, would be a great start while you're working on your conceptual uh, a model that's not reality, but but I, I understand. I mean, it's it's been going on for 20 years now, and so it seems like we're going to have to wait a little bit longer to look until something something's used. Also, uh, you said a, we're a minor player in Big Eye Tuna. The U.S. is. We're only 1,575 metric tons. A big eye tuna for the United States compared to 62,000 metric ton. We're a minor player. We've harvested in the last, I'll say in the last 10 years, an average of less than 50% of our swordfish quota, if not less than that. And I, I would hope that um, a continuation as I watch the industry continue on a downward spiral of infrastructure that somehow we can get some relief both in two ways. One in looking at, at, at closed area research before a conceptual model is done. And two is leveling the playing field at ICAT where the U.S. fisherman is, is, has a 95 page compliance guide, or might be 88, compliance guide and yet with these same fish that are swimming around the Atlantic, we allow other countries to harvest, which is ICAT standards, but yet we give them our marketplace with no standards. 
so other countries don't have to use circle hooks or not mandated it's a recommendation and so if we could have the continue if we could have the leveling of the playing field and it probably won't be in my lifetime but at least i can at least try to achieve that it, it would be a great start and so um with that i'll be quiet thank you thank you dewey peter hughes Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Randy, for your presentation. To follow up on Wes's question uh, in regards to swordfish, he asked most of the questions that I had. But, um, you know, I know about 10 years ago, we were in a position where we might um, lose a share of our swordfish quota to other countries such as Portugal. Um, do we face that same, I don't, I don't necessarily know that I would call it jeopardy, but do we face that same, are we in that same, uh, relatively same situation where um, it's a use it or lose it uh, type of scenario? Or, uh, or or do we have time, these are our fish, other countries recognize that these are our fish um, and, and they're not gonna try to um, take quota or, uh, or, or force us in some, in some way uh, shape or form to transfer quota to them. Uh, so I'm just wondering where we are with sword fishing if, and if we're in jeopardy of losing some of those fish. Thanks. Um, and so, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, ICAT, uh, at ICAT this come this year, um, the swordfish measure will be um, up for negotiation. Um, as with any um, species and negotiations at ICAT uh, that have allocations or that allocations are being developed, um, uh, that changes in allocation of quota could occur. Um, they don't happen unilaterally. So where the, the phrasing that's, that another country could take our quota um, is, is not really reflective of the way that negotiations happen. As I mentioned that negotiations are conducted via consensus uh, normally at ICAT. Um, uh, but it is the case that there are other countries uh, that um, would like to have more quota. Um, and the United States um, has been under harvesting their quota. It will be the United States goal to maintain our quota um, and, um, and things that will help us uh, along those lines are going to be our track record of um, research that has been conducted by the United States that's supported by the United States that facilitates accurate and good stock assessments. Um, the United States is a leader uh, among the countries at ICAT um, and has been for a long time. Um, our sound management of, uh, you know, of our fisheries uh, is also uh, in our favor. Uh, and so uh, while allocation is likely to be something that would be talked about and discussed this year at ICAT, um, we will be doing our best uh, to uh, defend our position and certainly represent our fisheries well. Thank you for that. I, I'm appreciative to hear that. Um, you know, one of the things that we did a number of years ago where you did, uh, HMS did, was to allow for a bycatch fishery in the ELAX fishery for swordfish um, in the hopes that that would increase our landing numbers of swordfish. Are there other fisheries that we could that that you could maybe make recommendations uh, about um, who who might be able to who currently don't have the ability to land swordfish but do have interactions with swordfish that could land those fish to hopefully um, hopefully increase uh, our our harvest on an annual basis? Uh, sure. So you referenced, yeah, one measure that we took uh, several years ago now um, to facilitate and permit the harvest, uh, the retention of a swordfish in that um, squid trawl fishery. Um, and we have also been intentional um, with some other measures that we've taken. Uh, for instance, we created a commercial, an open access commercial permit for hand gear for swordfish, somewhat analogous to the Atlantic Tuna's general permit, which is a directed fishery for tuna. Did similar thing for swordfish with with uh, with uh, some of our hand gears, um, and that has been uh, a successful thing, um, it providing additional opportunities to harvest swordfish. We've also, um, you know, done things with our other commercial permits, uh, some of our limited access permits, 
um, such as increasing retention limits in the swordfish incidental permit. Um, we've done some things administratively there to try to facilitate, make it easier for fishermen to use and manage their, their permits. Um, but we are, um, we are definitely open to thinking about other ways that we can look at managing our existing permits um, and or um, you know, making some changes along those lines that could facilitate um, uh, additional swordfish harvest within the sidebars and guidelines of several other constraints that we have, um, some of which uh, include impacts to other fisheries, some of which those species may be overfished, and so we have to keep those things in mind as we work to rebuild some of those, uh, particularly related to sharks. Um, and, um, um, and then keeping in mind um, some other uh, impacts to things like protected species um, and concerns under the Endangered Species Act and, and those kind of considerations. So a quick answer to your question is, is that I think we have, for the, for the ones that were um, big ticket items where there were significant landings of, of swordfish incidentally, we have recognized those um, and or they're covered under existing permits that could facilitate retention of those swordfish. Uh, but we are definitely open to anything that might come up. Um, and if you've got any ideas about things we haven't covered, I'd like to hear about them. Peter. And then I'd just like to say thank you uh, again for your presentation and for your answers. And uh, please let us know if there's anything that we can do to help facilitate that on, on our end or on the council's end. Um, because I, I sure wouldn't want to lose any uh, access to fish. So thank you. Chris Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Randy. Good to see you again. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for being here. I have a um, just a comment. It's not a question. Uh, you've been copied on a number of emails related to our uh, private recreational tile fish permitting and reporting requirements. And uh, the emails have basically indicated the importance of outreach to HMS permit holders indicating exactly, well, the outreach would be, hey, folks, we have these requirements and you should be aware of them and actually be reporting. So um, the request to, to your staff is basically to help us with that by providing information. Um, I don't need an answer today. I'm just emphasizing how important that is to uh, the council and certainly would appreciate anything you could do to help us with that. Thanks. Certainly, Chris. And yeah, I am aware of that. We've had discussions uh, with staff and I think we'll be getting back to you shortly. Lieutenant Commander Matt Cayley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you for the presentation. I just have a comment on uh, one of the things that you had mentioned on the high seas boarding inspection um, provision for ICAT, and uh, that would be a game changer for us. I know it's something it looks like have made some progress uh, in this past meeting, uh, but for us, we've run operations in the past few years looking at some of the foreign flag fishing fleets that are operating on the high seas out beyond uh, the reach of our EEZ, and we're challenged with getting on board uh, because without getting, we have to get flag state consent because there's no high seas boarding and inspection authority similar to some of the other regional fishery management organizations. So we're exploring bilateral agreements with some of these host nations, but uh, but that will be a game changer for us. And I wanted to, to say thank you for your efforts in trying to push that forward. Yeah, thanks for those comments. So, and we, we are very appreciative of U.S. Coast Guard's uh, role in the U.S. delegation when we go to ICAT as well. Do we? Yeah, just to follow up with kind of Peter's question about swordfish and quotas, uh, and Randy, you, you might could help me out with this. Probably 95% of the swordfish that Canada catches comes into the U.S., and they probably have over 1,000 metric ton quota. And so any increase in quota going to Mexico for swordfish from wherever it may come or whoever they may trade with for more swordfish, which they have in the past, what I believe Japan gave some big eye tuna up for some more swordfish, would directly come into the U.S. marketplace. So it's like a, a one-way street that they don't ship out of other countries, they ship into the U.S. And so any increase in Canada will, will be a further competing uh, uh, for U.S. fishermen of imports. and, and uh, in that number, uh, around 1,000 metric tons, Randy, or somewhere thereabouts, I don't know if you know that off the top of your head, but, I, but it, it's a good portion, it's a, a, a good amount. 
Yeah, I don't remember Canada's allocation off the top of my head. Um, I, you're in the ballpark of it, um, but I don't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head. Thank you. Any more questions around the table? I'm gonna go to the webinar, James Fletcher. Did Amendment 13 totally eliminate any rights that the per same votes had to potentially go into aquaculture, ocean ranching, and bluefin tuna? Did Amendment 13 totally eliminate the right that the five per same permits had to any bluefin tuna? Thank you. Yeah, so um, in Amendment 13, uh, which um, uh, eliminated the per seine category, uh, it did remove per seine as an authorized gear for bluefin. So it is correct that per seine is no longer authorized for bluefin and uh, could not be used. The question related to aquaculture is a little broader, um, and uh, that is a different issue um, that uh, uh, I think the nature of your question was potentially related to capture of bluefin, then moving them into a pen culture situation similar to what's done in the Mediterranean. Uh, that is not authorized in the United States at this time. Any more questions for Randy? Seeing none, thank you very much for being here, giving a presentation. And let's move on to our next agenda item. Uh, Russ Brown will give us a new uh, bluefish and spiny dogfish research track assessment. We'll give you a minute or so to get set up. So good morning, um, I'm Russell Brown. I'm the lead for the Population Dynamics Branch at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. I'll be presenting uh, the results of the spiny dogfish and bluefish research track assessments today on behalf of the um, Northeast Region Coordinating Council. Um, I will point out that these are research track assessments and in the research track, we basically develop the assessment methods that will be used ultimately to um, conduct management track assessments that then will be used to um, implement specifications. So this is really a methods development process um, and we have uh, a significant um, upgrade and improvement in the stock assessment for um, both of these stocks. So um, in the research track uh, assessment process, we do use uh, working groups. Um, we were very fortunate um, with these two assessments to get some leadership that was external to the population dynamics branch. Um, <clears throat> so here, the spiny dogfish um, research track was co-chaired by Connor McManus from, uh, from Rhode Island and Cami McCandless, who is in the center, but is with our Apex Predators program. Uh, Dr. Devorah Hart was the uh, lead assessment biologist for this assessment. Um, and we had a really wide sort of representation of working group members, um, both Mid-Atlantic Council staff, uh, commission staff, uh, a state biologist, um, and some uh, folks from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. This working group met um, between June of 2021 and November of 2022. They met a total of 23 times. Um, and for the spiny dogfish assessment, um, they basically ran with data up through 2019. Bluefish Research Track Working Group was also chaired by an external um, uh, individual, um, Mike Celestino, uh, who's with uh, New Jersey. Uh, the lead assessment biologist for this is, uh, is uh, Tony Wood. Um, and again, uh, we had sort of a broad representation on the working group, including council and commission staff, um, uh, state biologist, um, some university representation and, and folks from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, this working group met between July of 2021 and October of, of 2022, and they met a total of 21 times. 
Um, these research track uh, assessments were peer reviewed uh, in December of 2022. Um, we had a very experienced panel um, and actually all of these reviewers in our in our research track assessments previously. Um, so they were very familiar with sort of our assessment process. Start out with some spiny dogfish information. Um, if we take a look at the patterns and landings, we can see that landings, you know, peaked, um, you know, prior to 1990. Um, they declined as a result of uh, management regulation uh, in the 1990s through the early 2000s. Um, and they've increased somewhat um, in more recent times. Um, gillnets have been the primary gear um, that has been used since 1989. Um, and earlier landings were dominated by otter trawls um, in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and there was a lot of um, foreign trawler activity during that period. We can see that discards were historically high, but they've declined uh, to relatively low and stable levels. Um, over the past uh, two decades or so. We take a look at the surveys. Um, what we see is a general trend of males increasing over time. Um, if we take a look at the recent trend for females, um, they seem to be increasing slightly in the spring survey, um, but they seem to be decreasing in the, in the uh, center's autumn, uh, bottom trial survey. So we're getting a mixed signal from our surveys. Um, the other thing that we calculate from our surveys is sort of a spawning output, which is calculated as pup production, um, which is similar to, to spawning stock biomass. Um, it's been low in recent years um, and based on the spring survey, and that's due to a limited number of mature females. Um, and this is consistent with uh, observations that recent recruitment has been uh, low. So you can see the sort of the total biomass over time uh, and then the spawning, uh, the spawning output over time. Um, one of the uh, sort of interesting life history trends is we are seeing a, uh, a significant pattern of decreasing length and maturity in females. Um, so female spiny dogfish are maturing at smaller lengths um, in recent years um, and they're not growing as large um, and so you know, sort of the asymptotic uh, length of, of females used to be around 100 centimeters and it's declined approximately 10 centimeters over time. So um, the working group adopted a stock synthesis model. Um, this is a model that's used widely on the West Coast. Um, and it's also used on the West Coast for modeling Pacific spiny dogfish. Um, this model is attractive because it does not require age data. Um, which is not available for spiny dogfish, uh, at least in a time series sense. Um, and the model can work directly using uh, life data instead. Um, also, it has the capability of modeling the sexes separately. Um, and this is important for um, spiny dogfish, uh, where we see sexually dimorphic growth. Um, and we are also uh, very capable of collecting information on our surveys and, and even from the fisheries um, based on, on sex. So if we take a look at some of the stock synthesis uh, results, if we take a look at that red line first, um, we see that we see that basically um, this the spawning uh, output was very high historically um, and declined sharply um, you know, from the night from the 1990s to the mid 2000s. Um, and then it's sort of been uh, increasing slowly uh, through time, uh, but still is at relatively low levels uh, relative to what it had been. Um, and then if we, uh, if we take a look at the, the fishing mortality rate that was also previously high, um, and then has declined to relatively low levels in, in recent times. Um, so with the stock synthesis model, um, it typically estimates higher biomass and spawning output um, and, and lower F um, than some of the other you know, models that we've tried in the past uh, to model the stock. 
um, the trends uh, from 2000 over 2000 to 2019 are similar um, between the historical model that we used previously um, and the new stock synthesis model that was adopted in this research track. Um, so um, there is a key difference in terms of spawning output um, and, and biomass, and that decreased much faster um, in the survey statistic um, estimator that we used previously than in the SS3 uh, model that we're currently adopting. Um, and this may indicate some misspecification uh, in the time series, um, which could uh, involve either underestimated catch or potentially changes in growth. So one of the things, uh, one of the features of the stock synthesis results is that we have a uh, very little retrospective pattern in this model. I, my life would be so much easier if all of our stock assessments had a retrospective pattern that looked like this. Um, and so it's, it's very low and in, in, in significant uh, for this uh, terminal year 2019 growth. We take a look at reference points. Um, we, uh, the working group sort of adopted, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a rule of thumb that they really needed to produce more than two pups per female recruit. Um, in order to be, you know, in order for the population to be sustainable. Um, at current growth, that means an F of very low, um, potentially less than 0 0.03. The working group looked at a number of spawning per recruit reference points, um, looked at SS, S, uh, I'm sorry, spawning uh, per recruit reference points of 50, 60, and 70%. Um, at 50%, um, the SPR actually produced less than two pups per recruit. Um, and so ultimately the, the working group adopted a reference point of F of 60% uh, of SPR. Um, and um, so, you know, they explored uh, a number of reference points um, and ultimately adopted this as a reference point. Um, using that reference point, um, they estimated that the target spawning output um, is approximately 370 million pups. Um, the limit fishing mortality rate on females is 0 0.025, which is a little less than 0 0.03. Um, and the spawning stock biomass um, would be slightly, or I'm sorry, the maximum sustainable yield would be slightly less than 17,000 metric tons. Um, if we use these reference points um, to evaluate the situation in 2019, which is the terminal year of the stock assessment, um, we would see that overfishing was occurring uh, in 2019, but the stock was not overfished. Um, if we take a look at some short-term projections from 2019 forward, um, SS3, um, the stock synthesis model predicts a large drop in the spawning output between 2019 and 2020, and then gradual increases as several stronger um, year classes begin to mature. So you can see at the terminal year, or in those terminal years, we can see sort of an uptick um, in, the, um, in the spawning output. Um, there are some uh, uncertainties and research recommendations from the working group. Um, the working group was unanimous uh, that the lack of age and growth data um, during the past 40 years um, was the most problematic aspect of the, of the assessment. Um, they do recommend implementing an aging program for spiny dogfish um, uh, and to basically start to establish a continuous uh, time series of, of data to better inform uh, growth in the assessment model. As we're all aware, um, you know, uh, resources are limited, um, which means we need to take these recommendations in conjunction with a lot of the other um, aging needs for, you know, uh, all of our stock assessments. Moving on to bluefish. Um, so just a, a summary of, of model building. Uh, this, uh, this stock was previously modeled in ASAP. Um, and one of the first steps that the working group uh, did was to um, basically update the ASAP model. Uh, in this case, a reminder, the working group was able to update data through 2021. Um, the base model was, was constructed uh, by adding new data. Um, 
and uh, what they did was they sort of built a bridge uh, to transition uh, the modeling framework from ASAP uh, to a new modeling framework called WAM, uh, which is a state-based modeling framework that we're transitioning a lot of our stock assessments to. Um, and so uh, one of the features of WAM is you can actually bring an ASAP model in into that modeling framework and basically uh, reproduce you know, the results that you would have gotten within ASAP. Um, so again, a reminder, uh, WAM stands for the Woods Hole Assessment Model. Um, it's a flexible modeling framework uh, that can be configured uh, as sort of a traditional catch it age model, uh, which allows for building that bridge uh, from the previous models that we had in ASAP. Um, the working group uh, chose to transition this assessment to the WAM framework because of the flexible framework. Um, it specifically allows for estimation of random effects on recruitment um, and the numbers at age. Um, our state space models have tended to have lower retrospective bias um, in model results and more realistic estimates in terms of the uncertainty. Um, the shift into the WAM framework also allowed for exploration of an environmental covariates um, and, uh, and also estimation of, of catchability of different survey indices. Um, so um, the focus here was on model exploration within WAM um, uh, in terms of uh, investigating um, application of, of uh, state space modeling, um, but they also uh, were able to explore, you know, sort of one uh, covariate, which I'll get to later. Um, so the final model um, explored random effects on recruitment and numbers at age. Um, and this, they arrived at the final model after going through a series of eight or nine um, sequential models where they sort of um, investigated and sort of perturbed different aspects of, of the analysis. So if we take a look at the state space model results, um, this is this graph basically shows the top three state space models, um, and they were very consistent in sort of the pattern um, and the results. Um, the final model that was chosen by the working group uh, was a full state space model um, <clears throat> with number of age deviations on all the ages. So if we take a look at some of the results. Um, from uh, the final model configuration, um, we can see that um, the abundance uh, was previously estimated to be very high in 1985. Um, it declined um, to 162 million fish uh, by 1995. Um, it increased to another smaller peak of 269 million fish in, in 2005. Um, and the terminal year estimate is um, 162 million fish. Um, the estimates of recruitment have remained relatively stable, um, uh, you know, around 128 million fish. Um, recruitment has remained low over the past 12 years, however, um, and is estimated to be about 87 million fish in 2021. So if we look at uh, if we look at the final model in terms of the spawning stock biomass and fishing mortality rate, um, the spawning stock biomass, uh, as with most stocks, was historically was high. Um, it sort of reached a plateau, um, it peaked a little bit, um, and it has declined in most in recent years, um, and it seems to have stabilized and is starting to increase. The majority of the spawning stock biomass is comprised of age uh, four, five, and six plus fish. Um, and that has not changed over time, so we're not seeing a truncation, a truncation in the age composition um, in the population. Um, and then sort of the, the final good news on this stock is the fishing mortality rate um, has declined in recent years um, and in 2021 uh, was at a time series low. So again, if we take a look at final model retrospective patterns, um, we would expect coming out of a research track that the retrospective patterns would be pretty well behaved um, because it's something that we certainly uh, evaluate in terms of diagnostics, in terms of model selection. Um, and that's the case here. Um, the final model 
um, has improved uh, retrospective patterns over um, the base model. Um, and these retrospective patterns were considered to be minor for fishing mortality, um, recruitment, and spawning stock biomass. So um, one of the things the working group was able to do was uh, to uh, explore environmental covariate, um, and this was a companion model. Um, so this is not the model that's currently being proposed to manage on. Um, but they were able basically to um, generate a forage fish index um, and, and use that um, as an input into the model. Um, and inclusion of the forage fish index improved the fit of all the models um, and the model selection um, via a AIC, which is a, a way that we evaluate the, the fit of the model. Um, so um, the environmental version, uh, uh, you know, ended up, uh, you know, ended up basically adding value to the modeling uh, aspect of things. Um, in terms of, of the forage fish index, um, this is a part of a much larger project um, being conducted by our ecosystem assessment and dynamics branch. Um, Sarah Geitches leading leading the charge here, um, but it's basically looking at um, uh, forage fish consumption by a number of different predators. Um, and so um, there's a whole suite of predators that, that are being evaluated um, in terms of how they potentially could be interacting with each other through forage fish consumption. Um, and one of the key features of this approach is that they were able to sort of spatially aggregate some of these uh, indices. Um, and that's important in terms of applying uh, not just a coastwide uh, you know, forage fish abundance index um, to a given species, but to basically be able to target in on the range of um, occupied by you know, a particular pre uh, predator. Um, and so here you can see some of the dynamics in terms of uh, what the forage fish abundance uh, index looks like. This was modeled through VAST. Um, and you can see that um, forage fish availability um, has uh, fluctuated through time and in some cases is, is trended. So if we look at the environmental covariate model, the uh, companion model that basically incorporated this index, um, the model fit um, to the forage fish uh, index, which is shown in blue, um, and that shows a slight decline over in time, uh, which results in declining catchability or availability over time. Um, when it's fit to um, the catch pre unit effort index um, that we derive through um, MRIP and the recreational fishery. So um, the companion model um, was, uh, there was good agreement between the companion model and, and the base models. Um, and so it basically um, shows a slightly lower F and a slightly higher SSB uh, for most of the time series. Um, the goal here of the research group was really to start to explore things that they could explore further within the management track. Um, so they were able to basically transition this model over to the WAM framework. They were able to take an initial, um, an initial attempt at incorporating forage fish abundance um, within the assessment. Um, and they see great potential in this. And so what I anticipate uh, through time is that you may see some higher level um, attempts during the management track to um, further incorporate some of these environmental covariates. So in terms of the final model and the reference points, um, the F reference point is 0.248. Um, the spawning stock biomass um, at MSY is, uh, is, is estimated to be about 92,000 uh, metric tons. If we sort of uh, take this into a status determination framework, you can see um, the status over time. Um, and this stock has traveled uh, through uh, essentially all four quadrants of, of uh, possibilities here. Um, but in 2021, uh, it is estimated uh, to be not overfished and overfishing was not occurring. And then if we uh, take a look at this final graph, we can see sort of the uncertainty estimates around that status determination. 
Um, and the conclusion here is there, there is an 87% chance that the bluefish stock uh, in 2021 was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring. So I'm going to stop there, turn things back to the chair, um, and see if there are any questions. Thank you for the presentation, Russ. Any questions? Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Russ, for the presentation. Um, I was noticing, you know, in the briefing materials, we have um, a, a table that just shows how the the reference points or the status determination criteria have changed between the, the last management track assessment, you know, the continuity run of this 2022 assessment, um, you know, that was conducted during this research track and then, you know, sort of the final reference points. And so I think one thing that that stood out to me was that the, it, you know, when I'm looking at this, it looks like the productivity of the stock has gone down, you know, SSB, MSY has actually decreased from those three, you know, over those three time periods. Well, um, you know, our FMSY proxy has gone up. So that makes it makes it easier to not be overfishing and also to not be overfished as well. And I was just curious if there was any, I haven't looked at the um, the entire research track assessment report, but I was curious, you know, what the conversation was, um, you know, either within the working group uh, about, you know, what what might have, if there's anything in particular that caused that. And I don't know if that's something you can answer or Tony Wood can answer, but I just wanted to kind of put it out there. Thanks. Sure. I, I wasn't privy to most of the working group meetings where we tend to, we run like six to nine concurrent working groups or <laughs> six track working groups. So I, I more parachute in to sort of check on things. Um, but yes, it's it's not uncommon for for reference points uh, to be dynamic and, and trended over time. Um, they are calculated based on, um, you know, several things, including uh, changes in biology of of the particular species, um, sometimes changes in selectivity in the fishery and things like that. Um, so that may be, um, you know, part of the answer of why the reference points are, are dynamic and potentially trending. Um, I think from a management standpoint, it's good to see tables like that um, in terms of, of what's happened um, through time, um, because um, when you when reference points are dynamic and changing, the, that's really, in essence, changing goalposts for managers. So. Michelle. Thanks. Yeah, I was just curious if there was, you know, a particular change, you know, within the model framework that led to that output. I, I agree. I definitely would expect that as conditions have changed over the years that we would see, um, you know, that we would see those uh, reference point values change. Um, but thank you, definitely. Anthony, would you have another, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in if, if there's time. Um, <clears throat> can everybody hear me okay? Yep, sound good. Yeah, so uh, there a lot of changes were made, um, and I would say that the outlier in that table is the last management track. Um, so when the MRIP calibration went through, uh, none of the biological information going into the model changed, but the scale of the results changed because uh, the MRIP calibration basically doubled the number of bluefish that were out there. So that doubled the recruitment, which doubled the information going into the projections. Um, so we have refined the biological information going into this stock. We now have an age-based natural mortality. Uh, we have different model specifications, uh, adding selectivity blocks. Um, we've refined the MRIP index uh, the CPU index, which basically scales uh, some of the estimates coming out of the model. Um, so all of these changes have basically brought the reference points back in line uh, with what we uh, thought um, the stock was at coming out of the last benchmark assessment. So the the MRIP calibration, we, we weren't able to change because of our, our procedures. We weren't able to change uh, the biological information going into the, the stock assessment. 
Um, so basically the projections over inflated those reference points. And if you look at the stock status plots uh, coming out of that uh, management track assessment after the calibration, uh, you'll see that the stock uh, throughout its time period had never actually been at the proposed target, um, which is a little bit unrealistic. Uh, so um, the reference points are now more in line with what we used to um, with our, our, our past perception of where we thought the stock was at. So uh, coming out of that table, I would say that, um, you know, the, the outlier is the, the management track reference points, um, or at least that's what the working group felt. We feel like we're back in line with um, our perception of where we thought the stock was at uh, previous to that calibration. Uh, it's a little bit of a rambling answer, but I hope that helped, Michelle. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, it did, and, and really appreciate it. I know that that was definitely something that was raised after the last management track and a lot of concern from stakeholders about that. So thank you. Chris Pat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound fine. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Russ, uh, for the uh, presentation. Uh, a couple questions on the bluefish assessment. Um, uh, one, uh, I noticed in the uh, in, in the report that uh, the uh, recreational release mortality uh, for the uh, research track assessment uh, decreased uh, based on um, uh, a review of, uh, of literature on on that. Uh, I was just curious as to uh, you know, what 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 sources of literature and the literature review uh, resulted in a, in a lower release mortality rate. And the second question I have is uh, in the I know the assessment uh, was able to use more recreational um, release length frequency information across the, the, the range of bluefish for this uh, assessment. And the uh, one of the research recommendations is to uh, continue uh, getting more uh, length release length information. If more sources of release lengths are uh, are included in future assessments, could that just go through a management track assessment or would that be enough of a change where a new research track assessment will be required to incorporate that information. Thanks. Sure, I'll, I'll start to answer your question and maybe allow Tony to provide some details. Um, in reference to your last question, um, it would it would not require that to go back through a research track. That's a, that a change and a transition that could be done within the management track process. Um, and then Tony, I'm gonna let you answer the question relative to um, the recreational um, discard mortality. Sure. The, uh, the working group updated a meta analysis that was done, um, coming out of the last benchmark, uh, and averaged across some, um, some of the values coming out of that, uh, the manuscripts used for that meta analysis, uh, to derive a release mortality estimate. Previously in the benchmark, we had included a single study. Um, in that average that had a very high uh, discard mortality estimate for bluefish. Now it's a bluefish specific study that was done in tanks um, with some unaccounted for mortality that was probably uh, inflating that release mortality estimate. Uh, so we removed that, um, that estimate from the average basically, which is why our uh, release mortality went down from 15% to 9.3%. Four percent. Uh, the release mortality is now uh, in line with what is used um, for striped bass. Uh, we believe it's more representative of, of what the likely release mortality is. Um, and there is a full working paper that that details the full meta analysis uh, that could be made available to anybody who who wants to further dig into that. Joe Semino. Yeah, thank you. I, um, Tony's response to Michelle covered a lot of my questions on the on the continuity run compared to where we believe we are now. Um, so mainly, I left my hand up to say, um, job well done to everybody. Uh, really appreciate all the work that went into this, and uh, excited about the work that Sarah's done. Um, I, I, you know, I think we hear a lot about. The availability and catchability of this uh, bluefish 
sorry. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that work is, is really important and look forward to where it goes in the future. But considering where we think the status of the stock is now, I am curious what that means for our rebuilding plan as well. So, so just a reminder, um, the status information that we provided for you was up through 2021. Um, this um, assessment is on the management track schedule, so it will be updated um, with one additional year of data. Um, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll provide you with, uh, you know, a status determination coming out of that management track. Um, and that's the information that'll be, you know, obviously utilized to set specifications going into the future. Adam Nowalski. We've had conversation around the table, and I certainly know it's something the science center is continuing to work on, but concerns about how migration patterns have changed over the years of species and how that may impact their catchability through surveys as well, both time and spatially. Was there any conversation during either of these assessments to discuss the impacts of the migration patterns changing, possibly falling outside the range of catchability of surveys in recent years that may be impacting our perception of either of these stocks? No, that's, that's an excellent question. And I can assure you that both working groups and actually all of our research working groups are, are sort of looking at those sort of questions in terms of uh, changes in migration patterns, changes in distribution, uh, in general, to, you know, overall distribution, you know, it's a, it's a big one that the Black Sea Bass working group is wrestling with right now. Um, the fact is, we, we hope with some of the synoptic surveys, which are, you know, which are basically the Northeast Fisheries Science Center shelf wide survey um, that we're able to capture sort of changes um, in distribution or changes in migration patterns. Um, because this, the survey is, is intended to cover, you know, the entire continental shelf, you know, um, from, from Hatteras up to um, the Scotian shelf in Canada. Um, with things like spiny dogfish, you know, there are some questions about whether they actually migrate outside the range of the survey in terms of going, you know, deeper and potentially off the shelf. Um, so those are um, some potential questions and things like that. Um, where it becomes more problematic is with our sort of spatially limited surveys, a lot of the state surveys and things like that, where they're, they're surveying a small section of the total distribution of uh, the species. And there where you see distributional changes or, you know, migration patterns um, changing, um, that can be problematic. Um, the, other, the other area where um, where I have some concerns is um, in terms of uh, timing of when things move and things like that. Um, with our synoptic surveys, you know, we're surveying in the spring and the fall, we're surveying at the same time. But if, um, you know, patterns and where fish are and where they're moving, you know, start to change over time, that can be a potentially confounding factor in terms of the signals that we're getting from our surveys. Adam. So I'll, I'll summarize what I heard is that it's a topic of concern, um, but we don't know exactly how to deal with it yet and respond to it. So if that is an accurate summary, I would ask, is there something that needs to be developed as a term of reference going into these research track assessments moving forward? to try to elicit a more specific answer about what these impacts may be? And is there a role for this council to be part of that discussion in developing that so we can be better informed? And in general terms, without having the, the uh, research track terms of reference in front of me, um, my impression is that um, they, they kind of cover, you know, that they don't explicitly say that, but they do um, sort of, um, you know, raise questions in terms of, of looking at the spatial dynamics of, of stocks and things like that. So I think it's something that, um, you know, all of these working groups are looking at, um, on, you know, you know, and sort of incorporated into the terms of reference. And I know John has an additional comment here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Adam. Um, and just sort of on one of your questions uh, or one of your points, there are tools to address this. Um, 
John Manison developed some tools with the Butterfish Assessment a number of years ago, and those methods have been replicated by a group led by Rich Bell, uh, recently published this year in 2022. Uh, in essence, uh, modeling the distribution based on environmental parameters and then looking at how the survey overlaps with the environment through time. Um, and so, you know, thinking, starting to have the research track working groups, you know, think about applying that approach um, could be a way to sort of more formally address the issue which you raised in terms of shift, just shifting distributions and how do our surveys uh, interact with those shifting distributions. There are two tools available to do that. Dewey. Yeah, thank you and thank you for your presentation. I was curious as to the limits, depth, depth limits of the surveys. Sure, it's, it's obviously survey dependent, um, but with the center surveys, I believe it's 366 meters, um, which is divide that by two and that's fathoms. <laughs> And so that's bottom falling at 200 fathoms? Yes. Any more questions around the table? Go to the audience. Mike Wayne. Still can't hear you, Mike. All right, Mike, I'm going to go to James Fletcher, and then we'll come back and try you. James, go ahead. On the male fishery, the catch shows that we harvest roughly 10%. And all of your graphs never reflected that there should be, in the last 30 years, a substantial more amount of male fish. Also, the satellite tag showed that the male fish are offshore, where the survey is never done. So my question is fairly simple. How are we supposed to believe the amount of males that you show there in the decline and increase, which you don't show an increase? Why is it that we never get a estimate of the males? It is just frustrating that what we use in the models only seem to reflect what the modelers have a preconception of. So my question is, will you address the male fish and why there is not a thousand or two thousand times more amount than the females? And getting back to you using the early 80s as a high reference point, I was offshore in the 60s and 70s. And there were three to 500 foreign ships out there targeting. The Russians targeted the males and female dogfish. Now, how do you come up in a 10-year period of time between 76 and 86 and the stock rebounding? I'd like a couple of answers. Thank you. Jim, I'll do my best to answer your questions. I, I do thank you for your participation in the working group, too. Um, the fact is that the um, stock synthesis model does model both male and, and the female portion of the population. Um, we're all aware that, um, that the males and females um, tend to school by sex, uh, you know, so there are different distribution patterns. Um, and um, Jim, you are, you are correct in the sense that there was a very high exploitation by the foreign fleets um, early in the time series here. Um, but, the, but the fact is, um, for management purposes, we are setting um, the reference points based on the, the reproductive potential, which is you know, primarily um, the female 
um, portion of the population. Um, the implicit assumption there um, is that there are sufficient males um, present in the population, um, and the modeling seems to indicate that. So um, let me stop there. Are there any more questions for us? I was looking in the chat. I saw a chat from Mike Wayne. Okay, Mike, you'll you'll check you'll check with Tony directly. All right. Is there anything else, Russ, that you need to bring to our attention? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present in person. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, let's take about a eight minute break now. I guess we'll come back at ten fifty, and then we'll come back with Marissa Trago for the large Atlantic Large Well Tech Reduction Team. Marissa, do you want to do a mic check? Can you hear me? Yep, you sound good.
We're going to get started in about one minute. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's get started with our next agenda item. Eric Reed, do you have a comment? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under other business, I'd like to bring up something that uh, discussion we had in New England that's not referenced on your agenda, but I'd like to talk about it anyway, if that's okay with you. Yes, you want to wait? We'll, I'll call on you after the presentation. Thank you. Yep. I'd like to welcome Marissa Trago, Atlantic Large Well Take Reduction Team Coordinator. Marissa, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for having me today. I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, the results of our Atlantic Large Well Take Reduction Team here um, and talk a little bit about what our next steps are. Next slide. So, just an overview. First, I'll just let you know what the charge is to the Atlantic Large Well Take Reduction Team. Um, Talk a little bit about what the risk reduction measures um, are that we voted on at the end of our team meeting um, and talk about the package recommendations and the vote outcome. Um, we also have a, an extra slide on January right well entanglements just as an update. Um, so we had quite a few of those. So um, next slide, please. So as mandated by the MMPA, uh, when an incidental mortality and serious injury in U.S. commercial fisheries exceeds their potential biological removal level, we have to create a, a take reduction team to address this excess mortality. And um, so we use this to team to develop um, and they recommend measures that will reduce mortality and serious injury below that potential biological remo removal level. So the take reduction team process is this consensus based process. Um, where we get those recommendations from the team, but ultimately uh, NIMS is responsible for taking action and making sure mortality and serious injury is below that uh, PDR. So the Atlantic Large Oil Take Reduction Team specifically um, addresses mortality and serious injury of right humpback and fin whales. And the team is, is a fairly large team. It's a 60 member team and includes about 23 fishermen as well as several other stakeholder groups. Next slide, please. So there are quite a few fisheries covered under the plan since it uh, looks at fixed gear fishery risk along the East Coast. Um, I won't go over these in detail, but it includes mostly trap pot and gillnet fisheries throughout the East Coast, um, including lobster, sink gillnet, drift gillnet, um, as well as things like uh, blue crab and other fish pots. Next slide. So in 2022, the charge we gave to the Atlantic Large Well Take Reduction Team was to create recommendations to us that would reduce mortality and serious injury of right whales um, in US commercial fisheries to below that potential biological removal level for that species, which 
um, for North Atlantic right whales, it was 0.7 whale, um, 0.7 whales per year. So basically, one one mortality or serious injury in a year would go above PBR. We estimated that we would need about 88 to 93 percent total risk reduction um, to achieve that PBR to get a, a mortality and serious injury below that PBR, and that is a 41 to 46 percent additional risk reduction after considering the September 2021 20, final rule that we implemented um, that reduced uh, risk in the lobster and Jonah crab fisheries in the Northeast. Next slide. So the recommended measures that were brought to vote um, had three different components generally across regions. Um, so we discussed closures to buoy lines, um, line reduction, which was achieved through things like trap caps, line caps, trawl ups, um, and using one buoy line on trawls, and then weak rope. Um, a lot of the discussion centered around not only how these would uh, help risk reduction and which areas we should prioritize for which uh, types of measures, but also the implementation challenges, which included economic concerns, um, the affordability or readiness of ropeless gear, gear conflict and enforcement concerns, um, other things like equity concerns among things like track caps um, and, and really just implementation challenges, um, especially for things like line caps. Um, some other concerns included things like lost gear with re weak rope um, and the ability to use weak rope in, in deeper water. So there are a lot of really good discussions that kind of discuss the, the pros and cons of these different types of measures. Next slide. So first I'm going to go over the uh, elements that ended up in the trap pot uh, package that was voted on at the end. And then after that, I'll follow up with uh, some of the ideas for Gilnet. Next slide. So for trap pot and LMA1, um, there were quite a few seasonal closures to buoy lines that were recommended based on areas where either there was really high whale density or really high co-occurrence of, of whales with high gear density. Um, so these included uh, main zone A um, in June and July, an expansion of the LMA1 restricted area, and a closure in Jeffrey's Ledge in the spring um, and end of winter. Uh, also, New Hampshire waters and, and an expansion of the Massachusetts restricted area kind of into that Jeffrey's Ledge area. A lot of these addressed um, key risk in, in spring and summer as well as fall throughout that region. Next slide. In addition to those closures, we discussed um, kind of broad scale line reduction and weak rope. Um, so generally reducing the chances of entanglement um, and the severity of an entanglement. So the, this particular area looked at trap caps, um, seasonal line caps, as well as trawl length measures, um, and then also additional weak rope measures that uh, changed by distance or from shore or, or from depth. So there's a greater concern for the ability to use weak rope in deeper waters. So there are lighter weak rope, rope requirements in those deeper waters compared to more shallow waters where weak rope is more implementable. Next slide. In Outer Cape Cod, um, this looked, um, the recommendation for this area was to generally close this Outer Cape Cod area, which um, most of state waters are closed already. So federal waters will be closed from January 1 through May 15th. Um, there was a seasonal line reduction uh, proposed uh, in December specifically to avoid closing that month and then 100% weak rope. Next slide. Southern New England was another key area of high risk reduction um, that, that the team really kind of honed in on. And in this area in particular, it was really challenging to reduce risk without moving it elsewhere because this whole area shows quite a bit of risk. Um, so they prioritized options that would remove lines from the water seasonally and allow some fishing the rest of the year. So there are pretty large closures in LMA2 and the 2-3 overlap, as well as an additional um, closure area in the, that South Island restricted area, um, as well as some additional line reduction that looked at trawl length based on latitude and 100% weak rope. Next slide. In lobster management area three, um, this area was particularly challenging because all closures kind of move rope elsewhere um, and move risk around. Um, and this area in particular, the team wasn't able to come up with one substantial option 
that got to the risk reduction needed that would help us reach our risk reduction target coast wide. Um, so what you're seeing here are some ideas from the team, but also additional um, closures that we uh, provided as examples of how we would need to get to that target risk reduction. So they're very, very large closures because again, it's very hard to stop risk from moving around in this area. So there was um, again, that expanded LMA1 restricted area, South Island restricted area, and then there's these very large um, Gulf of Maine LMA3 closure in summer, and then in southern New England, uh, a closure that matches more the spring signal in, in that area. Next slide. Um, and in this area as well, there we tested things like line caps, um, which changed based on um, how whether they were north of the canyons or south of the canyons um, and relative to depth. So um, more in the mid Atlantic areas um, in deeper waters, uh, those requirements would be seasonal. And then weak rope was a, a little lighter. As I mentioned earlier, those deeper waters have more of a concern for weak rope. So it was a, a weak rope in the top 33%. Next slide. In lobster management areas four and five, uh, there were discussions of using trawl length to reduce line, as well as using one end line on trawls in certain areas. Um, and these were primarily for lobster, black sea bass, um, and other trout pot fisheries. Um, the one end line in particular would be Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, um, because there were some concerns expressed in, in North Carolina, or New Jersey, sorry, for um, using this one end line and the concerns for gear conflict. Um, and in this area, they also discussed using a 100% weak rope, um, which is at that 1,700 pound minimum. Next slide. To the gillnet package elements, um, we had a few different um, closures and line reduction options. Um, next slide, please. So largely in the northeast in the Gulf of Maine, there was one closure that address a lot of the gillnet risk. Um, and that is a seasonal closure west of 70 degrees and north of 42.5 degrees um, in April and May. Um, Southern New England, this area is really important and the, the team suggested to basically apply that South Island restricted area that we already implemented for uh, lobster and donut crab to gillnet um, for the existing season. Next slide. Um, additional options for line reduction in these areas included an end line cap, largely in Gulf of Maine and Southern New England, mid Atlantic, um, more explored, one buoy line in mostly a lot of, of, I think, medium gillnet fisheries year round in New York to Virginia. And then weak rope in this area, in these areas, varied um, based on depth and the different ideas of, of what different fisheries might be able to do. So in Gulf of Maine, in particular, those deeper waters. Um, they, they pulled back a little bit on that weak rope for implementation concerns. Um, closer in the mid-Atlantic, there were um, ideas that reduced the, further reduced the strength of head rope. So including additional inserts or full uh, weak line um, in that head rope and that 1,100 pound weak line. And then in the buoy lines using that 1,700 pound minimum lines. Um, and in, I think the only difference is in North Carolina state waters, they also discuss having a tide line. Um, which it would be even weaker than that 1700 pound blue line. So substantial reductions in rope strength um, across the board. Next slide. So that was the final package that was voted on at the end of the meeting. Um, we got a range of responses. Um, the total package uh, got about 88% coastwide risk reduction. Um, we got 7% uh, of the team saying they supported the measures, 45% supported it with reservations, 32% could not support it or opposed it, and then we had 16% abstain it. Um, across the board, we had fishery manager, managers in every single um, category of that, as well as industry in many of those. Um, none of the NGOs were able to support it, um, and then we had a mix of academics either supporting or opposing. Next slide. Some of the areas of general support, though we didn't get consensus, we we did get a lot. We didn't get a lot of strong opposition to things like the gillnet measures or the measures in the Mid Atlantic and the Southeast. Um, there was some mixed support for things like weak rope. Um, there were mixed feelings on how much it was used um, versus um, and where it was used. Um, there was also mixed support for uh, the progress towards ropeless um, and 
that final package included a statement of non-binding deadlines um, in order to achieve different rokeless targets that had some mixed um, feelings from the team. Um, a few other things got some support for the team, but didn't make it into the final recommended package. And that included um, looking at the increased values of the Massachusetts restricted area, um, as well as the use of dynamic closures in main zone A instead of a static closure. Some of the main concerns that we heard um, in the feedback on the vote was there was a request um, to submit an LMA3 package uh, later than the meeting. So we would include our, our NIMPS package as interim until the AOLA submitted a proposal of equal value for us to consider. Um, and, and a lot of people on the team had some concerns about that. Next slide. So in terms of next steps, this got a little bit complicated because after our meeting, um, as many of you may be aware, the Consolidated Appropriations Act was passed um, in December. And this changed a little bit about um, how we're going to proceed with our next steps. Um, in general, this act gave us a lot um, of prioritization for different research that will be important, um, including advancing robust technology and other technological solutions, um, which will be essential to implementing a lot of the recommended that we got from the TRT, including those one buoy line um, recommendations that we heard, um, as well as a solution to seasonal closures, which we saw a lot of large ones coming out of that final package. And that'll be helpful across the board for um, different fisheries, including lobster, but also uh, gillnet and other trap pot. Coastwide, um, we're also going to be further prioritizing surveys and other data collection that would improve model inputs on right whales and fishery distribution that will help decision making in the future. In terms of our rulemaking, um, this has changed a little bit how we've phased our rulemaking. Originally, we had a court mandated deadline that would um, implement this rule by the end, or at least publish a rule by the end of December 2024, where we would include everything in one. And now we just have several different pieces of rulemaking. So um, some of you may be aware we just uh, implemented an emergency rule. Uh, that closed that MRA wedge area that we closed last year. Um, so we we uh, implemented that this year and aim to put that into place permanently, potentially. And then we will be moving forward with a risk reduction rule um, that only looks at gillnet and mixed species um, and blue crab trap pot fisheries. Um, so separating that out from the total package that we kind of got recommended from the team, we'll use all those recommendations that we got in December, um, but we'll just move forward with the ones that we got for gillnet and mixed species trap pot, essentially. We'll work, continue working with the councils and commission on how we can allow alternative gear marking schemes to buoy marking. And that will help us kind of work on that using a one buoy line or implementing ropeless in the future. The final goal will be to have a rule that is effective by uh, December 31st, 2028. Um, that reduces risk in the lobster and Jonah crab fishery coastwide um, to uh, achieve that risk reduction we think we need to get below PDR. And so that would that would be effective by, so we'll have um, proposed rules ahead of that um, and opportunities for people to comment. Next slide. And just some implications for uh, the MAFMC managed fisheries. Um, just to summarize kind of what I talked about earlier, a lot of these gillnet fisheries, um, we might be talking about things like using one end line, weak buoy line, and additional head rope requirements. Um, and for the mixed species uh, trap pot fisheries, um, exploring things like minimum trawl length, again, using one end line on a trawl, and then weak buoy lines. Um, we'll have a, a, a lot of work to do to work on gear conflict and location marking alternatives to implement some of these, um, and specifically working with trawls and, and gillnet sets. Um, with only one line. The team did not include tie downs in their final recommendations. That is something that was discussed, um, but ultimately decided that they didn't reduce encounter risk enough, enough. So that isn't necessarily something we would be moving forward with. Next slide. And as I mentioned, I did have a, a, a summary of the recent entanglements. So in January, we had a really busy um, entanglement month. You may have heard a lot of these were. Um, off the mid-Atlantic or, or southeast. Um, so on January 8th, there was a four-year-old female that was um, spotted off shore of Car North Carolina that was entangled 
Um, that one is a serious injury, um, but unfortunately weather precluded the response so, and it was not recited. Um, it wasn't looking very good. We did not get enough documentation. Um, we weren't able to obtain gear. So there unfortunately isn't a gear analysis conducted. Um, there was another sighting on January 18th that was a reciting of a, a known entanglement. Um, that individual um, was spotted in, entangled in Canadian waters in August, um, and it's been recited a few times. Unfortunately, there also wasn't a response um, possible for that individual. There were two other sightings that we did actually have uh, response teams out um, to disentangle them. So January 20th, Nimbus um, was partially disentangled. They were able to retrieve a lot of their gear um, and the preliminary ID on that one is Canadian. Um, and on January 27th, Argo uh, was another entanglement that was cited um, that was, was fairly bad, but it was fully disentangled for the most part and rope and two traps were retrieved. And those ones, um, since we were able to get those traps and those um, ID tags on those traps, we're able to ID those as Canadian um, Nova Scotia lobster gear. And I think that's it. Next slide. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, I've got a question on area five. You just said one end line. Uh, I thought that in the meeting it was just going to, we discussed and it was just going to be basically November, December to maybe May 1st. Uh, is that still that or is it year round? I would have to check that, but that does, uh, I think a lot of the ones in the mid Atlantic were seasonal. So I'll have to check that. I think, I think you're right though. That might have just been left off our slide accident. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Marissa? Sonny Quinn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, could you um go back to page three at the beginning of your presentation? On the take reduction plan that you have here, is is this just for commercial fishing? Or, yes. or is, and why isn't there, um, with the take reduction plan, why isn't there a, uh, um, a wind power team, a um, recreational team, and a shipping team? Because it seems like they, um, they have the same problem as the, as the ropes in the commercial fishing industry. Right, so these tech reduction teams um, were specifically designed to address commercial fishing. So vessel, um, vessel risk reduction is, is done by a different team at headquarters. So they're working on a, a ship speed rule um, and wind is a, a, a little bit of a different process. So the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act said the take reduction teams up specifically to address commercial fishery risk specifically. Even though ship strikes and um, possibly wind power could be um, detrimental to the whales too? Uh, yes, it doesn't mean that we don't consider those. It's just a different process under the ESA um, and other other authorities. Um, if I'll invite Colleen to to speak up if she also has anything to add, but those are being addressed by other people. It's it's not that we're not addressing them. It's just not part of the same process. Yeah, that, Dr. Trago captured that uh, the take reduction team process is specific to commercial fisheries, which are essentially authorized to have non uh, serious injury and mortalities. But if there are mortalities and serious injuries that reach PBR, that's when the take reduction process is implemented. There are other uh, other actions. They are not authorized to have takes to get authority to have takes. They have to go through other processes. The incidental harassment authorization process uh, and in the case of uh, vessel speed rules, uh, NIMS, no federal agencies authorize most vessels. And so um, the the what NIMS has done to promote recovery of right whales in particular is to implement areas where there are vessel speed rules when right whales are available, but that's a entirely separate process. Thank you. And, uh, and, and one other question, Mr. Chair. Um, with um, with regards to the 10 or 12 humpback whales been washing up on the beaches and on the eastern shore in New Jersey, has there been any um, any signs of uh, 
you know, what the problem is? Has, have, has it been investigated thoroughly and do we know what's going on? Uh, we actually have a slide after the question slides that provides a quick summary. Um, the, we have investigated some of these or our, our stranding partners have uh, investigated those. A lot of these were uh, large whales in areas that were not very accessible. Uh, and um, while external exams have been done on all, on all of them, not all of them have uh, gotten a full internal exam. Most of them were in varying states of decomposition. So uh, even a full necropsy doesn't necessarily yield all answers. Uh, about half of the more recent strandings have been necropsied uh, and the uh, only, um, you know, we're still waiting on histology results, so we don't have all of our results yet, but the uh, results evident from necropsy uh, in three of these cases, there were signs of blunt force trauma, which is what we see when um, there is a vessel strike. Uh, in addition to the 18 that I've listed here that have stranded since December 1st on the East Coast, there was actually another humpback whale um, that was reported yesterday, the day before in Southern Virginia. Yesterday it was still floating and they were trying to secure it. So that one hasn't gotten a full examination yet. Okay, thank you. And, and just one other question. Um, if, if there's 10 or 12 whales dead like that, do you extrapolate that to come up with a larger number because there there could be more out there that we, you don't see? Does, does that number more than what we're, we're actually seeing? Yeah, we don't have a model that would allow us to do that. Um, I know in our right whale population model, they're able to estimate mortalities. I think they're working on that. If they haven't already done that, John here may know for the humpback population but not necessarily associated with just this mid-Atlantic event. We do know that, you know, mortalities of marine mammals happen all the time. Only when they're near shore do we see them necessarily on the beach. Um, and right now we also know, well, we have been told by um, wreckfish guys, particularly in the mid-Atlantic, that there's a lot of bait near shore, which might be one of the things keeping these whales in the near shore. And <clears throat> excuse me, one other question, Mr. Chair. Ahead, um, with all these whales washing up on the beach, do you know of um, that maybe there should be another investigation on if, if there's any other species out there that might not be washing up on the shore but we could be affected by? Well, well right now what we're hearing is well, what I'm hearing from my constituents is um, you know wind power is the number one cause. But uh, do you think there could be any other species out there that are dying that we don't see and uh, is it's not showing up. Um, I mean, that is possible. We, uh, I, I, we, uh, Dr. Trago and I don't work with the program that has evaluated uh, the the wind power activities for uh, impacts on marine mammals. I I do have um, noted here some places where you can get more information. The, these are live links in the package. You should be able to get to some more information through those. Um, from, from what I understand, the current activities, at least in that near shore area, are not anticipated to be causing that kind of problem um, unless animals are right under a narrow zone of um, right under the boat. Uh, I do think if we were seeing a lot of animals in the near shore, those would be washing up on the beach. Uh, and we did have an aerial survey conducted yesterday. Uh, it was already planned. Really, we're looking at um, right whale surveys in the mid-Atlantic this year. They did not see floating animals during that aerial survey. They were really looking for larger whales. Uh, so they also didn't see additional humpbacks. That was off of, I believe, mid-coast New Jersey and um, further south. Thank you. It's just been it's just been a lot of um, it's a lot of whales washing up on the beach, and there's been some other critters washing up on the beach, and it it should be a uh, it you know it should be a top priority to find out what's going on. Uh, something's going on out in the ocean with this many um, this many whales washing up on the beach, uh, and I you know I hope we can get to the bottom of it. So thank you for all the answers. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Trago. Thank you, Dr. Trago.
Okay, and just a quick update that the humpbacks are part of an unusual mortality event that's been going on for since 2016. So the necropsy results and these incidents will be looked at by this peer review uh, group of experts that have been pulled together for the unusual mortality event. So this is an ongoing investigation. It's not something that's been closed. John here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Sonny, I think we all agree it's tragic. Uh, there's no other word to use for it. Um, and trying to work from what we do know, you know, where a cause of, a cause of death, but where a cause of injury has been attributed for these whales that are washing up, it seems to be ship strikes. Um, and that's a general category, not a specific category. So what we know is that some of these animals were hit by ships. Um, and that sort of leads, you know, the agency to really think about that vessel speed rule um, as being you know, very important for us to do to help protect whales from ship strikes. John, I got a quick question. If is it possible that say sonar blasting from windmills or whatever is screwing the whales up and instead of naturally getting out of the ship's way now, they're confused and getting hit by the ships? Is that a possibility or is that just, we don't know? And with the, with the evidence that we currently have, it doesn't seem like it's a possibility. Um, but again, it's, it's hard because you're making inferences about how animals are going to behave to sound. We, can, we can't do experiments on them. Um, but with the information that we currently have, it, it doesn't seem like that's a possibility. All right, thank you. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a quick question. I, I noticed um, that last week, I think, was a, a peer review of the, um, the North Atlantic right whale decision support tool. And I was curious, if you all could offer any, um, you know, sort of preliminary report outs on that, you know, were there sort of major changes or additions recommended to that tool? I believe that's the same tool that's being used to develop the vessel speed rule. Is that correct? That's actually a, a different tool. We use a similar whale model, but the, the tools themselves are, are different and built by different people. Um, we are waiting for the final report on on the peer review they they did get give a little bit of a summary at the end but they're going to do a final written report at which time we'll have a webinar for the trt john Harris. stay tuned for that yeah that final report will be publicly available um and our response to that final report will be publicly available it's a scientific peer review so we are fully expecting recommendations to improve the model um and sort of we're thinking about it sort of, you know, short term, you know, what are we, what should we be doing right now? And then long term, what should, what should we be doing over time to improve the model? Chris Bad Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the uh, presentation, Marissa. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you showed that uh, two of the recent uh, right whales uh, with, with entanglements uh, had evidence of Canadian fishing gear on them. And I know it's outside of uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act's uh, jurisdiction, but was curious if you knew whether uh, the Canadian government was uh, considering or implementing uh, further uh, regulations to uh, reduce the risk of right whale entanglement in their waters. Thanks. Uh, well, I can't speak for Canada. <laughs> um, I, they they've put out some some press releases and and noted the importance of being able to trace some of those back. I don't think they've um, been able to trace anything back to the that lobster fishery in quite a while. So um, I, I would hope that they would consider that um, in, in, in their actions that they're already taking. Colleen, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think they have acknowledged that most of their efforts have been in the Gulf of St. Lawrence where the snow crab fishery primary area where they know there have been snow crab interactions. So they've got closures in place there as well as dynamic closures if right whales are seen. The Nova Scotia area is also an area where if they saw whales, they would put in a dynamic closure. However, they're not doing much surveying there and this interaction is causing them to revisit. Uh, so I think we may see an increase in surveys if they can reach it. The Gulf of St. Lawrence area that they're already serving is a huge area. They're covering a lot of ground and I'm not sure 
what capacity they have to expand their surveys, but this definitely is something they're revisiting based on this incident. The only thing I would add is, is that they do have, um, they did get a report that the gear was missing. So it's, it's a great opportunity for them to be able to trace back um, when, when that gear was lost, um, which is helpful. Really? Yeah, thank you uh, for your update. Can you turn, uh, go to slide 17, please? It is is this here a um, was what the outcome uh, of the take reduction team, and then y'all gave different levels of uh, agreeing with it or not agreeing with it or abstaining from it. Is that is that kind of how this is right here in front of me? Is what came out of it, and then uh, what's going to happen from the differences of what we see here? And when would that take place or another discussion? Uh, what goes, what's next past this right here on page 17? Please. Right. So this is, these are what the team um, ended up voting on, at least for uh, Gilnet, uh, line reduction and weak rope. Um, these were, yeah, we got varying levels of support um, for different things. Ultimately, we will turn this into a proposed rule to some extent. We still have to work on things like implementation and seeing what makes sense um, based on what the team discussed um, and recommended. Um, but we'll use this as a framework to inform what our proposed rule will look like. Um, we're hoping to get that together. Um, and I, I don't think we've talked timelines, but hopefully by early next year so that people can have a chance to um, comment on it and provide feedback on what is in the proposed role and the different alternatives that we analyze. Um, yeah, I so just, we, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to give a comment on North Carolina federal waters based on my experience. Okay. Uh, and the way that fishery operates is a gillnet fishery that is actively looking for a mark and you have 10 or 12 boats running around. You have different tide conditions, weather conditions, and you need two buoy lines uh, to be able to successfully sit and retrieve your gear. And so what you have here would work. Anything less than that uh, uh, would not work, uh, particularly the North Carolina federal waters based on, on my knowledge. So I'm hoping that this stays, makes it through the way till the end. And, and um, this is workable, particularly to the federal waters in North Carolina. Thank you. Lieutenant Commander Matt Cayley. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks for the presentation. I had a question on uh, slide 20 you had listed there where uh, things are supposed to be. The proposed regulations are supposed to be in place for the, the take reduction plan by 2028. Um, is, I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Um, it, does that incorporate all of the, uh, the, the gillnet and trap pot fisheries, uh, like a deadline, or, or do you anticipate phasing those in? Or I'll just kind of wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Uh, we anticipate one rule for everything but lobster, essentially. So that Atlantic gillnet mixed species, blue crab, all of all of the fisheries covered under the plan, um, aside from Atlantic or American lobster and Jonah crab fisheries. Roger, thank and you. If, and if I could jump in, effective by uh, the end of 2028, it would be for all East Coast commercial yep. fisheries for as needed to achieve our goal of getting below PBR. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. David Stormer. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and apologies if I missed this, but I was wondering if you could sort of briefly uh, describe what constitutes um, an unusual mortality event? Uh, Colleen here. So uh, we do have triggers that, uh, or, or we do have standards that um, NIMS looks at before declaring one. It tends to be related to when it is uh, an increase compared to normal or strandings occurring new er in new areas. Or if they can if they can tell there's some new uh, factor causing a stranding. 
So I believe this one was triggered because there was a large uptick in the number of humpback whale stranding on the East Coast starting in 2016 relative to the historical number. So, okay, thank you. Um, so that, so there's, there's one, this is a single unusual mortality event from 2016 to the current time? Yes. Thanks. Any more questions? Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. Uh, in New England, we had this presentation, but we also had a presentation about ropeless fishing. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Hughes is going to cover it in his liaison report, but I think it'd be appropriate to do it now if that's okay with you. Yes, go ahead. Great, thanks. So uh, the discussion, uh, the development of ropeless fishing gear is a big part of what's going to happen moving forward prior to December 2028. Uh, and there's certainly going to be a need to address gear conflicts between ropeless and mobile gear, ropeless and other ropeless gear, and ropeless gear and hook and line gear, both recreational and commercial. Uh, in New England, you know, a lot of our FMPs already have an outline or a process to resolve gear conflicts. Uh, but to that point, uh, we've had a request from the RA, Mr. Petney, to, to stand up a working group or a committee. I prefer a working group uh, to address these issues. Uh, at our January meeting, you know, in New England, we discussed at length this idea and we fully support it. Uh, we don't really have a structure yet, uh, but our, our plan is to have the executive committee and the staff work towards a, a proposal for our April council meeting and for approval by that council uh, at that time. Uh, the start date will most likely be uh, for whatever kind of group is formed sometime in the summer. And of course, you know, part of that group will be having active fishermen have their input considered. So, you know, lastly, given the range of right whales, perhaps this council, if you're interested, should participate in that working group. And maybe Mr. Petney would want to add something to my comments and this discussion. But it, it's not on your agenda, but I'm just putting it out there. So however you want to handle it, that's fine with me. I'm happy to take questions. Mike Petney. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, uh, Eric. And he's correct. We, we raised this because as we work through the, you know, the recommendations of the take reduction team and work through the meetings, it's clear that, you know, by the time we're, we're looking to have effective rules in place, December 20, you know, December of 2028, ropeless technology is going to be a, a component of that. Um, and so we want to make sure that between now and, and when that happens, that we've done everything we can to work with all facets of the industry that will be affected by that. So obviously, we're continuing to work, and the Science Center is leading the way on working with um, members of the lobster industry to ensure that the ropeless technology functions as it's supposed to. Um, but a really important piece of the package is how that gear can be seen and identified by uh, others that are out on the water, particularly mobile gear fishermen, but also um, you know, uh, private anglers, uh, recreational fishermen, and, and others, enforcement included. So um, working through the, a process between now and then, making sure we're engaging with the people that need to be uh, to participate in that process so that the end result is something that is workable, affordable, um, and effective for being able to identify the gear on the water um, and avoid it if necessary. And so, as Eric said, the New England Council's FMPs, you know, have sp some specific provisions around gear conflict committees or advisory panels or work groups. Uh, and so we have suggested that the council stand up such a group um, as soon as possible to start working with us and, and on, on this issue. And certainly, as Eric has said, invite the Mid Atlantic Council to participate in that process um, as much as possible, you know, but obviously up to the um, discretion of the council. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I know personally I'd like to be involved just from the standpoint it's going to affect how I fish. Sonny's already been doing some ropeless technology. Uh, Chris, is this something that staff, Carson, you can get involved with, I suppose? Something that we can do? 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I don't see any downside to, uh, to getting involved and certainly uh, has application to folks around the table. So I guess the next step, I have a question for Eric. The next step would be for us to basically reach out to Tom or to basically integrate ourselves into this, this work group and figure out scheduling and that kind of thing. Or is there a decision that you need to make at your April meeting before we proceed with anything on our end? Eric. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Moore. I mean, I, you know, like I said, the structure of the committee had, or the working group, the working group, let's call it a working group. Um, hasn't been decided yet, but if you're interested, I, you know, I don't know if it's going to take a phone call or put something in writing to just say that you you are interested in participating, and, you know, whatever that structure may look like. I, I don't think it needs to be that. I mean, you're welcome to send a letter. So, but I, I think just the conversation with New England would be fine. So thanks for that, Eric. So just to be clear, I, I think getting the sense around the table and based on leadership here that we are interested so that we you can convey that to the folks back at uh, uh, New England Council staff. Um, and certainly we could send a letter, but I'm, again, I'm trying to figure out after we've indicated our interest, then we'll just wait for you, for you all to develop the, the potential structure and reach out to us and say, these are the kind of folks that we'd like to have involved in the working group. That, yeah, that I idea? believe that to be correct. Thanks. All right, sounds good. Any more questions for Marissa or Colleen? Anyone from the audience? James Fletcher. Isn't it true that if we totally eliminated all commercial fishing, totally, that in the next 30 years, due to man-made chemicals going into the water, that the whales would go extinct? It may not be 30 years, but hasn't it been predicted that chemicals coming from man-made and PFABs, which are plastics, will totally eliminate the species in the next period of time? Isn't that a true fact? Thank you. Colleen here. Uh, what we, uh, the best available information indicates that the, the top causes of uh, mortalities to the North Atlantic right well in the past decade has been uh, vessel interactions and entanglements. Um, you know, climate change has certainly affected distribution and modified distribution and possibly affected fitness, but uh, human interaction does appear to be the, the biggest cause. And the um, population models uh, that I've seen, some of them are still being peer reviewed, but they suggest that if we eliminated impacts of uh, entanglement, we would see a, a change in the trajectory. Uh, the, the population was recovering. Uh, numbers were going up from lower numbers than we have today, so we know it can recover. Mike Wayne, let's try this again, Mike. I mean, this time. Can you speak up a little bit? I think I heard you briefly. You got me. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mike Wing with the American Sport Fishing Association. Um, I can't remember what slide it was, maybe 24, the one that's talking about the recent um, whales that have, yeah, this one. So, you know, I'm trying to think about these vessel strikes, human interactions. During the necropsies, is there any information that is gleaned on, um, like, what what was the impact associated? Like, what were the prop scars looking like? Kind of matching up the the vessel strikes to an actual vessel on the water. And I think my question might also involve some input from the Coast Guard, because the way I'm thinking about this from a recreational fishing vessel standpoint, which are typically smaller vessels, 
I'm operating under the assumption that if a recreational fishing vessel hits a multi-ton whale, that I'm assuming the Coast Guard would hear about it. Is there anything in the necropsy that can help you understand which vessels are hitting whales? Obviously, you can't look at rope size and everything to link it like you can on the gear entanglement. But I'm just wondering kind of the coordination between vessel strikes and assigning those to a vessel, a specific vessel type or size. Colleen here again. Um, we have in rare occasions had uh, some information that occasionally even could be uh, identified to a vessel class or at least a prop size. Uh, or in some cases to a vessel because vessels have come in uh, disabled by uh, by hitting a whale. But um, the strandings that we're seeing right now in the Mid-Atlantic, those have been impact strandings. Not We're not seeing prop scars. We're seeing uh, something that you can really only see during a necropsy. We're seeing huge uh, signs of blunt force trauma. Um, when the when the outer layers of the whale are peeled back, when the blubber is peeled back, we're seeing these large this large bruising, sometimes broken bones that show that there was a vessel impact. Um, those cannot be identified to a vessel unless you know. We also have cases where a, a vessel calls in and um, and tells us that they that or tells the coast guard that they uh, hit a whale, and sometimes they need a tow in. Uh, but that's not the case in this area. And this is one of the most, the, the high traffic areas when the speed rule was studying this area, um, that kind of uh, Delaware Bay to, to uh, Massachusetts mid-Atlantic area um, had something like 800 plus um, vessels that uh, were recorded under AIS. So those are the larger vessels or the vessels that are required to use AIS. Uh, in in any month, so there. This is a pretty high vessel traffic area, including a lot of large vessels between some of the larger East Coast harbors. So um, some large vessels can hit a whale and never even know it. Mike Haley. Oh, hey, Mike. I just to respond from the Coast Guard uh, perspective. So whenever there's a whale strike, if it is a hazard to navigation or something that could potentially be a safety concern. Uh, we will typically put broadcasts out, or if it's more egregious, you know, possibly send a boat out. Um, largely, when it comes in uh, kind of identifying um, the incident or whether whatever caused um, the, the whale to die, uh, we will support the folks that go out and analyze that more, whether it be stranding teams or folks from the aquariums that want to go and take a look. Um, so we're kind of a responding uh, entity in that role and more in support of um, as opposed to actually doing any kind of investigation or, uh, or work in that sense. I'd like to thank you for that support. The Coast Guard has been fantastic helping us with drift analysis and other um, investigations into the context going on out there. So thanks much for that. Are there any more questions? I do not see any. Marissa and Colleen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the presentation. And I'm sure we'll be getting updates as time goes on. Let's go to our next agenda item, uh, financial disclosure and recusal presentation by John Almeida. John, whenever you're ready. Mr. Chair. Yeah, this is a barn burner. People are running for the exits. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning and welcome to the 2023 GC briefing on um, council members, financial disclosures and recusals. Um, where we get new council members on board every year and where some of these points can get sticky and complicated, I think it's a good idea to just walk through and give everyone you know, a reminder of the framework we're operating in uh, each year. Um, and if folks have questions, I'll try to answer them at the end of the presentation, or if I can't answer them, um, I'll try to track them down before our next meeting. At their core, the government ethics statutes and regulations are about ensuring that public officials place public interest over private gain. Taxpayers have, you know, can reasonably expect that 
Public officials are not in their position for their own private interests, and the framework we have in place helps to ensure that that happens. It's important to recognize that the ethics regulations are not the same as our everyday understanding of ethics, which are based on personal moral codes. The ethics regulations are strict rules that everyone must follow, regardless of whether we personally believe that we can be objective in our decision making. The statutes and regulations are very strict for federal officials when it comes to working on matters in which the official has personal financial interests. And this, statute, uh, this slide here shows the default standard for federal employees, federal officials, which is basically we can't do it. We can't work on um, matters where we have personal interests. And doing so, you face criminal or civil penalties. And council members are considered federal officials for purposes of federal ethics rules. But the Magnuson Stevens Act gives council members an exception to the very strict prohibition on that previous slide. Um, and this is largely because in setting up the council system, Congress decided that it wanted to have folks with expertise in fisheries management. And if the strict default standard of, you know, the regular <laughs> government ethics rules applies, we likely couldn't have that expertise in our decision-making process. Section 302J of the statute sets up the requirement that council members must disclose their financial interests and must recuse themselves from voting on matters where there would be a significant and predictable effect, that phrase is important, uh, on their financial interests. That's different than the default federal ethics statute a few slides ago. Um, the default would be no involvement if there's anything above a minimal financial interest. Here, the Magnuson standard allows for a council member's involvement as long as it doesn't have a significant and predictable effect. And again, Congress did this presumably to ensure that we have the people with the ex experience and expertise sitting at the council table working on these fisheries issues. Um, and the default standard would require a lot more recusals. Um, as this slide notes, the standard applies to appointed council members, but not NIMFs or state officials. The disclosure of financial interest is the key to this ethics framework. Disclosures put everything out in front so members of the public can understand where council members are coming from which fisheries they're involved in, what companies they work for or that were owned. The carrot for disclosure is that disclosing your involvement allows your participation in discussions and deliberations, even in a situation where um, you might have to recuse yourself at the end of the day. Of course, with the carrot comes a stick. Um, and that comes in the form of if you fail to disclose or if there are false disclosures, those are violations of Magnuson-Stevens Act, which can result in civil penalties, permit sanctions, and removal from the council. This could also result in the, the provisions of the default standards kicking in, which means potential civil or criminal penalties. There are three general categories of required disclosures, and the first is the most common one we look at, and that's ownership or employment in a company or a vessel engaged in a fishery managed by the council. The second is employment in an organization whose members are engaged in a fishery managed by the council. And the third is ownership or employment in a company that owns or is owned by another company engaged in a fishery managed by the council. And this third category relating to indirect ownership gets to some of the more complication, complicated situations and calculations that we would need to do um, when figuring out if recusal is required. There are two other categories that don't appear on this slide because they're less, less common. Um, and those are employment or ownership in a company that provides essential equipment or services for a fishery managed by a council. And the second is employment or ownership in a company that provides representational consulting or legal services for companies and vessels that provide essential services or are involved in the harvest uh, processing, marketing, lobbying advocacy of a fishery managed by the council. 
those last two are less common. So whose interests need to be disclosed? Um, the council member, your own, your spouse, your minor children, your partners, and any organization where you serve as an officer, director, trustee, partner, or employee. In this context, partner means business partner as opposed to romantic partner. As for the timing of them, we need them each year by February 1st. And when you join the council, it needs to happen within 45 days of joining the council. But, and this is important, if things change over the course of the year, we need to get revised disclosures within 30 days. And this is important because things can and they do change over the course of the year, and we need to update those disclosures within 30 days. With disclosures, there's an explicit presumption that the disclosures are true and accurate, and that the designated official for making de determinations on recusals, me, um, I'm not going to be digging in really uh, to, to determine their accuracy if I don't have any reason, you know, any suggestion that they're not accurate. This presumption is based on Magnuson's requirement for accurate disclosures, you know, going back to that carrot and the stick earlier. Um, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't preclude me from relying on other information that may be available. So, you know, again, the accurate disclosures are very important and I'd urge council members to work with uh, Dr. Moore or me if you're running into complications or having difficulties when you're uh, making your disclosures. The other piece relating to disclosures is that if there isn't a specific percentage of ownership listed, the presumption is going to be 100% ownership. As we get into this, you'll see why it's important and why you should always list an accurate percentage of ownership interest. Because if there isn't, if you own less than 100%, but you don't let us know that, we're going to presume 100%. So when is recusal required? Um, the answer is here in this first bullet. And you note the, the bolded phrases. The statute tells us that recusal is required when there's a council decision that would have significant and predictable effect on the financial interest required to be disclosed. When a council member is aware of this, the council member can voluntary, voluntarily recuse him or herself without going through the process of asking for uh, GC review. And I know in the past, uh, Dan Farnham has done a voluntary recusal um, and that, you know, any council member can do that without asking me to, to do the research. Um, if you know that you need to recuse yourself or you feel you should recuse yourself, you, you have that ability. Um, so there's a multi-step termination for recusal. And if you go through these steps, if any of them, you get a no answer, then there's no need for recusal. Okay, and we're going to walk through the steps in the next couple of slides. Okay, first question, is there a council decision? The ethics regulations define council decision as, as it's described here in this slide. Approval of an FMP or an FMP amendment, request to a regional administrator for changes to regulations, finding of an emergency and request for emergency action, and comments on a secretarial or FMP, FMP amendment. Um, those are what triggers the recusal. So if you don't, again, if you don't have a council decision, if it doesn't fall within those categories, there is a need for recusal. So what isn't a council decision? Uh, committee motions, even committee recommendations, you know, at, at the last committee meeting before an action, they're not a council decision. So you don't need to recuse yourself at a committee level. Um, likewise, council motions and deliberations leading up to a final action, you know, whether to put something out for um, uh, an amendment out for public review, that's not a final action subject to council, that it's subject to recusal. Um, actions that don't have implementing regulations, like typically specifications, or some frameworks even 
don't necessarily have implementing regulations. So they, they may not require recusal. Um, but I, I'd caution with that piece because sometimes we don't know at the council level whether there will be regulations, whether there's a need for regulations. So, you know, if you think you might be um, bumping up against a council, a, a recusal issue, um, have a talk with me and Chris, me or Chris, me and Chris, um, when it comes time for those votes. Okay, and remember the, the key phrases from a few slides ago. Um, in the, it's the council's decision that has a significant and predictable effect. Uh, so the statute tells us that significant and predictable effect is when there's a close causal link between the council decision and an expected and substantially disproportionate benefit to a council's council member's financial interest relative to the financial interests of other participants in the fishery. Again, these two highlighted phrases are defined in the regulations. So close causal link is defined as when a council decision would be reasonably expected to directly impact or affect the financial interests of affected individual. The regulations flesh this out a little bit, telling us that where there are implementing regulations for a council decision, so when there are regs, there's generally a presumption of a close causal link. And when there's no implementing regulations, there's generally a presumption that there's not a cl close causal link. The exceptions to these presumptions will hinge on the facts uh, of, the, of the situation that you're looking at. So if you have a situation where there are regulations, but it's unlikely or speculative that they'll have a causal connection to a council member's financial interest, then there won't be a causal link. And the flip side, where there are no regulations, but there's a real non-speculative expectation that there would be a causal connection, um, that may lead to recusal. Now, expected and substantially disproportionate benefit, um, it, that's defined in the regs as a positive or negative impact with regard to a council decision that's likely to affect a fishery or a sector of the fishery in which the affected individual has a significant financial interest. So what is a significant financial interest? It's basically the magic number of 10% interest in harvesting, marketing, or processing of a fishery affected by a council decision, or ownership of more than 10% of the vessels using the same gear type in the fishery affected by the council decision. Now, this is where we get into the uh, attribution piece. How much of an interest will be imputed on a council member? And we're gonna look at four common situations here. The first two are pretty straightforward and the second two get, this is where you get some complexity. Uh, so direct ownership. So a council member's direct ownership in a company, the percentage of ownership in the company will be used to calculate how much interest the council member has in the fishery. So if a council member Bob owns 10% of a company that has 50% interest in harvesting of the orange fish fishery, Council member Bob will be attributed 5% of that harvest of the overall fishery. So that's below the threshold of 10%. Uh, for employment, as opposed to ownership, employment, it's full attribution. So all of a council member's employer's interest will be considered for recusal purposes. So in this situation, you know, Bob works for, council member Bob works for a company with a 50% interest in the orange fish fishery that entire 50% will be attributed to council member Bob for purposes of this um, attribution analysis. For indirect ownership, this is where you have a company with ownership in another company, it's proportional attribution. So council member Bob owns 50% of a company and that a company owns 50% of another company, then council member Bob will be attributed with 25% of the second company's interest. So if that second company harvests 50% of the orange fish fishery, then council member Bob will be attributed with 12.5% of the orange fish fishery for, for recusal purposes. Um, the last example, parent ownership, a company that owns part of the council member's company, its full attribution 
to the council member if the parent company owns 50% or more. So if council member Bob's company is partially owned 50% by council member Bob and a second company with a 50% stake, then council member Bob will be attributed with all of the second company's interests. So if that second company harvests 10% of the orange fish fishery, then council member Bob will be attributed with that 10% harvest for recusal purposes. For employment with fishing organizations or associations, there's no attribution from other members fishing activities. But if the association itself engages in fishery in a fishery managed by the council, then the association's activity would be attributed to the council member. When considering ownership interests of a spouse, partner, or minor child, we don't use the proportional attribution described in that last slide. But for employment of a spouse, minor partner, a minor child or partner, that doesn't get attributed to the council member unless the compensation fluctuates based on the financial performance of the company. So if it's straight salary or an hourly wage, um, it doesn't get attributed to the council member. But if compensation is tied to how the company does, then it does get attributed to the council member. So how do these recusal analyses get started? It's usually by the request of a council member, um, but they can come about by NOAA GC initiating the process. Um, Chris and I usually talk a couple of days before a meeting, um, and if there's a pending issue that might lead me to, you know, start that analysis, um, you know, we'll we'll figure that out in our in our conversation, and sometimes that'll lead to other conversations with a council member, or sometimes they're resolved you know, without further discussion. I would urge council members to contact me if they have a question, um, and the more lead time, the better. From the last couple of slides regarding attribution, you can see it gets kind of tricky. Um, so the more time we have to work through the issues, the better. And you know, one thing to remember is recusal only keeps you from voting. Um, you can still participate in the in the discussion. You can still participate in the you know from the committee level to the council table. You can participate in the process. You just need to um, announce that you're going to recuse yourself on the final vote. Uh, and you can even tell how you would vote if you didn't recuse yourself. So it's it's basically you're allowed to participate in the deliberation. The important thing is that you disclose um, the recusal and the need for recusal. Um, and then, you know, as far as recusal determinations, if if I make a determination that someone needs to recuse him or herself, um, that can be appealed to NOAA General Counsel. And again, the earlier we start the process, the better, because General Counsel has 30 days to decide. And if we don't, you know, build that into our determination until right before a council meeting, it could be too late. And, um, you know, we can't undo a council vote that's already happened. Okay, one more basis for recusal. This one is pretty rare in application. Um, if a council is considering a matter that's primarily an individual concern of a council member, then a council member must be recused and cannot participate in deliberations. Again, this is a rare situation and, you know, something like a grant or a contract um, that will be awarded to a council member, um, you know, that would be the kind of recusal that I'm talking about here. Um, it's, I, I was trying, you know, trying to think of a fisheries decision where this would take place and it would, likely it would have to be a fishery of very few participants um, or an issue in a fishery that affected, you know, basically one company or something like that. And one of those companies was owned by a council member. Um, you know, in that rare situation, the council member couldn't participate in uh, in deliberations, unlike most times when we're talking about recusals. Um, so this last slide has some resources. Um, 
on you know the citations on recusals and and the regulations um the rules the re regulations were revised relatively recently um but one thing i'd like folks to take away from this presentation is that you know the the issues can get complicated based on the particular facts of the situation and i'm here to help you work through them and if i can't figure it out there are others in NOAA gc who will help us um and so again this you know if there's something on the horizon that may require recusal the sooner we can get our hands around it the better um and at this point i'll take any questions from if anyone has them and, and do my best to answer them any questions for john pat gear thank you very much john um What would happen if the general counsel initiated it, but the member did not feel that they should be that it applies to them? If, well, if they, if general counsel initiated it and went through all the way to the conclusion that there needs to be a recusal, then the council member could appeal that decision. Okay. Any more questions? Everybody must be getting hungry. All right, with that, that concludes, I guess, this morning's agenda items. Sometimes since we get jammed up for lunch, let's uh, take a little bit extra lunch. We'll come back at 1.30, 1.30 and finish the meeting for the day. All right, see you guys in an hour and 25 minutes.